Good morning and welcome to today's New York Council hearing for the Committee on Finance. If you wish to submit testimony, you may at, at testimony at council.nyc.gov. At this time, please silence all electronic devices. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee uh, meeting, hearing. I am Council Member Justin Brandon. I have the privilege of chairing this Council's Committee on Finance. I first want to introduce my colleagues that have joined us today, Council Member Powers, Ayala, uh, Lewis, Brooks Powers, Barron, uh, Ose, Sanchez, and Moya. Um, today the committee will be holding an oversight hearing to solicit feedback on the final report and recommendations of the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform. This marks the first hearing the Council has held on property taxes since 2011, and the conversation is long overdue. To that end, I'd like to open by thanking the commissioners present with us today and all the commissioners for their long hours and hard work in bringing this property tax reform one step closer to reality. New York City's property tax system is badly broken, fundamentally unfair, and purposefully opaque. In part because of our misguided, outdated laws, property taxes in working and middle class neighborhoods are skyrocketing, while the property taxes in wealthier neighborhoods remain artificially low. A few years ago, for instance, an ultra luxury condo at 220 Central Park South sold for $238 million. At the time, it was the highest price tag for a home in the nation. Yet, that new Manhattan homeowner paid less in property taxes than the homeowners of a two-family home in the Bronx that sold the same year for $439,000. There are hundreds of other examples of these types of infuriating, nonsensical inequities across our city, where brownstone millionaires are paying a lower effective tax rate than middle-class homeowners in Diker Heights and Far Rockaway. To determine the levy or how much the property tax has to raise, the Department of Finance calculates the market value of all city real estate, it takes a fraction of that number to establish the assessed value, then multiplies that by an average tax rate. The levy is then divided proportionally among the four property tax classes, each assessed and taxed at different rates with various exceptions. However, how much that proportion or class share can rise in a given year is capped at a certain percentage, and any excess must be passed on to the other classes, making someone's taxes impossible to predict from year to year. Where our problem lies is that everything I just said, the fractional assessment, the division among the tax classes, the restriction on class share rise, are requirements established by state law. Other state law requirements have also proven harmful. Right now, New York City must cap increases in property assessments at 6% each year, or 20% over five years. In theory, this should protect homeowners from rapidly rising taxes, but in practice, it has artificially suppressed the tax bills of high-priced homes and hot real estate markets, while the tax bills for moderately-priced homes continue to increase steadily. This is why a Park Slope home valued at close to $1.6 million can get a $4,000 property tax bill, while a home on Staten Island's North Shore valued at $700,000 gets hit with $6,500 in property taxes. Another cause of this inequity is yet another state law requiring condos and co-ops to be assessed as income-producing properties rather than based on comparable sales. The problem is acute in Manhattan, where luxury condos, luxury condo values get determined by comparisons to nearby rent-stabilized apartments. This leads to severe undervaluing of many homes and explains why the median effective tax rate, or the amount of taxes paid per $100 of property's market value in Manhattan is only 45 cents less than half that in Staten Island at 97 cents, or the Bronx at 91 cents. And because the city levy is based on the total market value of real estate homeowners in these working and middle class outer borough neighborhoods are subsidizing the property taxes of wealthier ones. After years of hard work by members of the council, past and present, 
like-minded advocates and everyday New Yorkers. The Property Tax Advisory Commission was formed in May 2018 to thoroughly examine the property tax system and develop recommendations to make it simple, clearer, and fairer while avoiding reduction in revenue used to fund essential city services. In December of 2021, the commission issued its final report with 10 recommendations. The 10 recommendations involve expanding class one to cover one to three family homes, co-ops, condos, and four to 10 unit rental buildings, all valued by comparable sales and not rental income. The current valuation methods for the remaining class two and classes three and four buildings would remain. Replace the assessment caps with a five-year phase-in of market value changes used in larger class two and class four buildings. Ending fractional assessments and instead calculating property taxes by multiplying a new lower tax rate by the full market value. Ending the existing class share system and instead freeze tax rates for five-year periods with future changes to happen proportionally among all classes. Financial safeguards for the transition to the proposed system like a five-year phase-in of market value changes and a homestead exemption for owner-occupied homes and circuit breakers for primary resident owners to ease any tax increases on lower-income families and seniors. And lastly, requiring a comprehensive review of the property tax system every 10 years. Today we'll have the opportunity to discuss the administration's position on the Commission's report and recommendations, as well as receive feedback from members of the public. Before we begin, I want to thank, of course, Finance Committee staff, Michael Toomey, Kathleen Ahn, Andrew Wilbur, Emra Adev, Ray Majeski, and my senior advisor, John Yedin, for all their hard work behind the scenes in putting today's uh, hearing together. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my committee counsel, Michael Toomey, to swear in our witnesses. Good morning, you raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm that the testimony will be tr uh, your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you, you may begin. Thank you, good morning, Chair Brannon, members of the Finance Committee, members of the council. I'm Preston Niblack, I'm Commissioner of the Department of Finance. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the administration of Mayor Eric Adams on the subject of reforming New York City's system of taxation of real property. Uh, I'm going to start today with a quick overview of the current system's main features, highlighting in particular some of the features of the system that were the subject of recommendations by the Advisory Commission on Real Property Tax Reform. The Advisory Commission, as you stated, was impaneled by Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Johnson in 2018 and delivered its final report in December of 2021. Then I'll review the Commission's recommendations for reform. In our view, the Advisory Commission did an excellent job in analyzing the shortcomings of the current system and laying out a plan to make the system fairer and more transparent. Circumstances have changed since the Commission did the bulk of its work before the COVID pandemic. We're reviewing the Advisory Commission's recommendations to make sure we fully understand their impact on New Yorkers and determine whether they should be modified. Also, a review uh, is needed of issues that the Advisory Commission didn't tackle or propose changing. This is work that needs to be done by both the Administration and the City Council together. So today I will also present some additional preliminary analyses of the Commission's proposals to help members of the public and you, the City Council, gain a deeper understanding of the impacts of the Commission's recommendations for taxpayers. So as I said, I'll start with a quick overview of the system's main features. I'm gonna go through this quickly since you've already covered this in your opening remarks, but four classes of real property. Class one uh, consists of one, two, and three family homes. Class two consists of multifamily residential buildings with more than three units. Within class two, I wanna highlight in particular two subclasses in the context of the commission's reform proposals. Class 2A, which consists of four to six unit rental buildings, and class 2B, which consists of seven to 10 unit rental buildings. Class three includes property of regulated utilities, and class four is, of course, all commercial properties and includes many uh, nonprofit uh, properties as well. Properties are valued differently in each class to determine their taxes. Class one is currently the only class in which properties are valued based on the sales price of similar properties. Class two large rental properties and most class four commercial properties are valued based on the income capitalization method where net operating income is divided by a capitalization rate to determine market value. One peculiarity of this system is that class two co-ops and condos 
that is, home ownership properties, must be valued as if they're income-producing rental properties without regard to how they're valued in the sales market. This introduces some significant disparities in tax burden between similarly valued properties that are used for the same purpose, namely as someone's home. Notably, because of the lack of comparable rentals at the highest end of the co-op and condo market, there is a significant degree of compression of values resulting in lower effective tax rates, that is, taxes paid per $100 of market value on properties that sell for millions of dollars. Um, we also cited the example that you just cited of the condo, world's most expensive condo, uh, purchased uh, a few years ago, and the taxes, the effective tax rate is 23 cents per $100 of market value for a unit that was purchased for $240 million. That's compared to an average effective tax rate for condos citywide of 73 cents. Another feature of our current system is that the tax rate adopted by the City Council each year is not applied to the market value that DOF has calculated, but rather to a fraction of the market value, the assessed value, under the system known as fractional assessment. Fast one properties are taxed based on a target ratio of assessed value to market value of 6%, subject to caps on how quickly they mean increased, which I'll discuss in a moment, and other classes are taxed based on a ratio of 45% of assessed value to DOF market value. Fractional assessments are a common feature of property taxation in other jurisdictions, but they add a layer of complexity when taxpayers are trying to understand how their tax bill is calculated. Adding more complexity are statutory caps on the allowable growth in taxable assessed value, the AV growth caps. On class one properties, the caps are a maximum increase of 6% in any given year, and a maximum increase of 20% over any five-year period. Class 2A and 2B small rental buildings also have AV growth caps of 8% per year and 30% over five years. So this can create confusion and frustration for homeowners who see their market value flat or even declining, but see their assessed value and hence their taxes continue to rise until the ratio of assessed value to market value catches up to the target for that class. Just as significantly, the AV growth caps create inequities across properties within the same tax class. A homeowner in a gentrifying neighborhood with rapid growth in market values may see the growth and assessed value of their homes lagging the market due to growth caps. This will cause the property to be relatively undertaxed compared to a home in a neighborhood where market values have not grown as rapidly. Finally, to add yet one more level of complexity and opacity to the whole mix, while the council adopts one tax rate for a year, there are actually four distinct tax rates, one for each property class. These tax rates are derived from the so-called class shares of the total amount of property taxes billed, the tax levy. Class share systems constrains how the total levy is divided among the four classes, limiting the degree to which the relationship among the classes can change, even if the market value of one class is increasing faster than the others. It is fiendishly complex, and there are very few people who actually understand the mechanics of the calculation, one of whom is sitting next to you. So with that brief background on the current system, let me turn now to an overview of the Commission's recommendations and how they propose to address some of the distortions, inequities, and lack of transparency in the current system. First, the Commission's work was guided by a few values and objectives. Make the property tax system fairer. When we refer to fairness in taxation in terms of both horizontal equity and vertical equity. Horizontal equity means that similarly valued properties that have similar uses should pay roughly equal taxes. Vertical equity means that effective tax rates should be proportional to the value of a property. In the words of the final report, the Commission sought to strip the system of the features that lead to structural inequalities. Second, make the property tax easier to understand by eliminating elements of the system that make it difficult to understand how your tax bill is calculated. Third, the Commission sought to ensure that low and moderate income homeowners can afford their tax bills and remain in their homes and communities. And finally, the Commission was charged with crafting a revenue neutral reform proposal. To accomplish these objectives, the Advisory Commission proposed four key structural changes to the current system. First, the Commission proposed the creation of a new residential tax class that would include current Class 1, 1 to 3 family homes, plus co-ops and condos currently in Class 2, and the small rental buildings currently in Classes 2A and 2B. For convenience, I'll refer to this as the new Class 1. Second, properties in the new Class 1 would all be assessed based on sales-based market value. That is, the sales-based valuation currently applied to Class 1, 1 to 3 family homes 
would be extended to co-ops and condos so that their treatment would be uniform, but also would be extended to the valuation of small four to 10 unit rental buildings. Third, the commission proposed ending the unnecessary and confusing fractional assessments in all classes and simply applying tax rates to market values. And finally, the commission proposed doing away with the assessed value growth caps on class one and classes 2A and 2B properties. Instead, changes in market value would be phased in over five years, which is the current practice for market value changes for class two large rental buildings and class four commercial properties. These four structural changes would result in a vastly simpler, more transparent system that would get rid of many of the inequities in tax treatment that are embedded in the current system, while greatly simplifying the system for taxpayers. To promote home ownership as a key element of stable communities and to ensure that low and moderate income households can afford their property tax bills, the Commission added two targeted homeowner relief programs on top of its structural reforms, a homestead exemption and a circuit breaker. The homestead exemption excludes a portion of the taxable value of a home that is occupied by the owner from taxation. The Commission put forward two possible versions, a 20% flat rate exemption that would phase out as household income rises, and a slightly more complex graduated marginal rate exemption. Under the flat rate exemption, a primary resident homeowner with household income up to $375,000 would see 20% of the market value of their home exempt. That is, they would be pay tax on 80% of the value. More well-to-do households would pay tax on a progressively larger share of their home value up to a household income of $500,000 when the exemption would phase out entirely. A circuit breaker is another common feature of property taxation in many jurisdictions. Its purpose is to ensure that lower income households can afford their property tax bills by granting the homeowner a credit for property taxes above a certain percentage of their income. The Commission's proposal was to fully exempt property taxes above 10% of income up to a maximum $10,000 total benefit for incomes up to $58,000. Owners with an income between $58,000 and $90,550 would receive a declining percentage of the amount by which property taxes exceed 10% of income. The Commission also recommended replacing the arcane and complicated class share system with a system in which the relationship between individual class rates would be fixed for a five-year period. Any change in the overall tax rate would simply result in proportional changes in each class's rate. If the council were to lower the property tax rate by 10%, for example, each class's tax rate would go down 10%. Those were the commission's key recommendations for reform. Taken together, they would transform a complex and arcane system riddled with inequities and distortions into a simpler and fairer system that would be easier for taxpayers to understand. The benefits in terms of the basic credibility of the system to taxpayers would not incidentally be considerable. What about the remaining classes of property? What did the Advisory Commission not do? The Commission did not recommend any changes to the treatment of Class II large rental buildings. These are income producing properties for their owners and the Commission found and we agree that the income capitalization approach for valuing them is the correct one. But what about the renters themselves? The tax burden on large buildings, on large rental buildings, is significantly higher measured by their effective tax rates, again, the taxes for $100 of market value, than it is on other residential property. The Commission recognized and acknowledged that renters pay at least some share of property taxes through their rents. In a tight market such as New York's, owners of unregulated apartments will generally be able to pass along increases in property taxes in the form of higher rents. However, because it is difficult to ensure that any tax reduction would be passed through to renters, the Commission did not make a specific recommendation for renter relief. The potential impact on renters is of particular concern amidst the current affordable housing shortage and as New Yorkers are already facing rising rents and inflation. Addressing this issue will require careful consideration of potential solutions and caution to avoid any possible adverse implications that would further restrict the availability of affordable housing. There was also no discussion in the Commission's report on the future of tax incentive programs, such as the recently expired 421A program, which encouraged the production of affordable rental housing. And finally, the Commission did not recommend any changes in how Class IV commercial properties are taxed, finding that as a general matter, the tax burden in New York City on such properties was comparable to that in other large cities across the country. So now I'd like to turn our attention to what taxpayers could expect if the Commission's proposed reforms were enacted 
and highlight a couple of issues that raise some concerns for us. In what I'm about to present and discuss, we've modeled what I'll call the baseline reform model, which includes the 20% flat rate homestead exemption and the circuit breaker, both of which are financed within the system, that is, by using a slightly higher tax rate on the new class one to pay for homeowner relief, rather than funding it from an external source or by raising the rate on other property classes. First, the majority of all properties, 63% or almost 855,000 parcels, in the new class one would see a reduction of at least 5% in their property tax compared to currently, where currently means 2021 when the analysis was done. The median decrease would be about $1,500 per year or 30%. A larger share of primary resident homeowners in the new class one, 73%, would see a decrease in their tax bill. The median reduction for them would be roughly similar both in dollar terms and in percentage terms. Inevitably, however, in a revenue neutral approach, reducing the existing inequities in the system mean that some owners who are currently relatively overtaxed would pay less under reform and some who are relatively undertaxed would pay more. Thus, 28% of all properties in the new class one, about 374,000 parcels, and one in five primary residents would see an increase in their property tax of at least 5%. The median increase would be about $2,000 or 36%. A small share of properties would see minimal or no change. The distribution of reductions and increases matters, obviously. The Advisory Commission's recommended approach would vastly improve both, horizontal, improve both horizontal and vertical equity amongst homeowners compared to the current system. In terms of horizontal equity, the Commission's recommendations would greatly reduce the disparity in effective tax rates paid by property owners, which currently vary widely. In FY 2021, half of primary resident owner occupied properties had an effective tax rate of between 60 cents and $1. Under reform, this range would be reduced substantially with half of all taxpayers falling between 57 cents and 75 cents. This is a huge gain in horizontal equity and would help eliminate the systemic biases embedded in the current tax system, largely through eliminating the distorting effect of AV growth caps. In terms of vertical equity, the Commission's proposed reforms would also represent a vast improvement. Most taxpayers with household incomes below $500,000 would see a tax reduction, with the largest reductions going to the lowest income households. In contrast, higher income households would generally see a tax increase. This correction in the direct direction of greater vertical equity arises from two causes. First, by capturing more of the value of high-end co-op and condo apartments under a sales-based value valuation approach, and second, by providing targeted homeowner relief to lower income households. Now, it's important again to bear in mind that since there are no proposed changes to the remaining classes of property, the revenue neutrality constraint applies entirely within the new class one. For this reason, given that more property owners will see a tax decrease than a tax increase, the median decrease would be less than the median tax increase. Moreover, benefiting primary resident homeowners in the new class one would mean that much of the burden would be shifted onto non-primary residents and other properties. While over 70% of one to three family homes, co-ops and condos are owner occupied, the rest are largely rented by owners to tenants and many of these properties would be subject to increases. In particular, we have concerns about what this would mean for the small four to 10 unit rental buildings currently in classes 2A and 2B. Because these buildings also have caps on growth and assessed value, they are often taxed on an assessed value well below the target ratio of 45% of market value. Taxing them based on sales-based market value in the same class with one to three family homes, co-ops, and condos would result in a tax increase on 58% of these buildings. We need to understand the impact of tax reform on renters in the new class one to ensure that they are not adversely impacted by the tax reform. These broad issues, the distribution of tax burdens between owners and renters within the new class one and relief for renters in the larger class two buildings are ones that concern us and that we think require further examination in developing recommendations for a tax reform proposal. Moreover, the current economic and budget environment, including rising residential and commercial mortgage interest rates and high levels of office, continuing high levels of office vacancies makes the context for reform more challenging and int introduces new complexities and uncertainties in assessing the dynamics of reform proposals on different segments 
of the city's real property markets and on revenues. This too requires further study. That said, I want to reiterate our respect and gratitude to the members of the Advisory Commission for their work. Although there are some issues that we think require further consideration, the basic framework of their proposal strips away four decades of growing inequity to propose a fundamentally simpler and fairer system. We look forward to working with the City Council to build on the foundation laid by the Commission's work to create lasting change that will make New York City a fairer place for all its residents. And I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we've been joined by Council Members Carr, Brewer, Kagan, Hudson, and Velasquez. Um, I just want to read into the record a letter that we received from the Governor's Office uh, from Assistant Counsel to the Governor, Sherelle Bedard. Uh, thank you for your invitation, the opportunity to testify at today's committee hearing on property tax reform. Unfortunately, we will not be able to participate. However, we greatly appreciate all the work that the City Council is doing to address issues of great importance to the residents of the City of New York, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Um, so it's good that we can all agree. I love the line, um, fiendishly complex. Um, I think we can all agree that the, the prop, our current property tax system is, is badly broken and dysfunctional. Um, and it's existed in its current, its current form for close to 40 years. Uh, but I think it'd be good to understand the consequences of what a bad property tax system does to the city just beyond making our constituents mad and confused. Um, so could you tell us what the consequences would be of leaving this property tax system in its, its current uh, troublesome form? I, having, a, having your constituents be mad and confused is no small thing. <laughs> um, and I think uh, part of the problem there, as I said, is that the property, leaving the property tax system in place um, is problematic from the point of view of the credibility of the whole system. A system that people can understand where they can look at their bill and see how we got to their taxes. Here's your market value. Here's your tax rate. Multiply A by B and here's, there's your taxes is vastly, uh, I think, obviously more, more accessible, easier to understand for taxpayers. And that is, uh, I think, really a crucial thing. Um, the current system, as is well known and well documented, has uh, a number of inequities, and they are systemic in their effects across neighborhoods and different communities. Perpetuating those is not for the good, of the, not to the good of the city as a whole, not for good for its economic development, not good for those citizens in uh, communities that are being unfairly treated by the property tax system. Uh, so I think you know we we want to have a system that treats all our citizens uh, in a manner that is fair and understandable to them, and that promotes uh, stability uh, in neighborhoods and growth. Beyond issues of fairness. Um does the inequitable level of taxation amongst different homeowners have an impact, would you say, on those households and their ability to, to get ahead in life? Uh, I, you know, there are some, it, it, it distorts the market, right? These different levels of taxation means that properties are valued uh, differently than they would be if taxation were more uniform. Uh, I think that that uh, favors some taxpayers, some of whom may not necessarily need to be favored and disfavors some taxpayers uh, who live in other areas where the market growth has not been as rapid, for example. So, you know, I think we're, we're all familiar with the disparities in tax treatment between Brownstone, Brooklyn and, you know, uh, Staten Island, mid-Staten mid Island. There are big disparities there that are uh, not justifiable by any market value. And I think that those, uh, I mean, I, I know you wanted to go beyond fairness, but there's the, a the basic lack of fairness in there, but it also uh, it undermines the valuation of properties and undermines the neighborhood, uh, the equitable neighborhood growth, I think, and I think that holds back some neighborhoods unnecessarily. And you think the system as it is discourages housing and commercial development in our city? Um, there are a lot of reasons why, let's talk about housing for a moment. I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons why uh, 
housing construction and, and the lack of chronic lack of affordable housing is uh, continues. Um, the administration has put forward zoning text amendment and a housing blueprint, which attempt to address some of that. We were big supporters of um, uh, Governor Hochul's 485W proposal. We will will be a high priority for us next session. So there are a lot of steps uh, outside of just property taxes that I think need to be taken to address development. Uh, again, a, a property tax system that is perceived as fair-handed, um, even-handed, and, and uh, easily uh, understood and administered uh, is only a benefit in terms of development. And understanding that this commission and its report was put together by a previous administration. Is the, is the Adams administration supportive of all the proposals in, in the commission's final report? So the, w we think what I was trying to convey in my testimony is we think the basic framework and the structural reforms that were proposed and the targeted homeowner relief all in concept are exactly the direction we need to go in. We do think there are some consequences which we've been digging into that are more problematic. Um, there was no, no consideration given to what happens for renters. We're concerned about the distribution of taxes within the new class one um, that will impact renters adversely in some cases. Um, we're not wedded to all the specifics at this point of any piece of it. Um, but again, I think the, the, the basic concept and framework was absolutely spot on um, and that there are a number of issues that are difficult, frankly, to, you know, uh, we need to understand them better. It's a little bit harder to understand them when, every, when, when everything's moving in the market as it is now in kind of unpredictable ways. Uh, but, uh, you know, we want to try and come forward with some proposals that will address some of those issues that we identified. Aside from those, uh, you know, unintended consequences, are there other issues that the commission didn't address that you think should have been looked at? I know you mentioned in your, that in your testimony, but are there things outside of those consequences? I think th those are the big ones uh, for us. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, we have to, it's, it's a very complex system, and it's not least because it is a very complex property market. Uh, and it's not a single property market, obviously. It's many, many property markets, many, many neighborhoods. Um, so I think we really need to spend time and have been spending time wrapping our heads around what the implications are at a, at a level of detail that we all will, you and us, will need to really understand before we move forward. So I think the, you know, we need to be careful about what the consequences are of some of these changes. We have another issue that I didn't mention is, you know, there are some taxpayers who under reform uh, would see their taxes increase very substantially. Um, and we have to really think about, like, what's the transition mechanism for some of those taxpayers? Is the, are the uh, parameters of the homestead exemption and the circuit breaker the right numbers? I mean, those were obviously tied to certain uh, benefit programs in place at that time. Uh, but we just, there are a lot of pieces that we have to look at, I think, to make sure we understand how the moving parts affect each other. And by our understanding, all but one of the commission's proposals, I think the one to have a holistic review of the property tax system every 10 years, all of the commission's proposals would require state law changes. Do you agree with that analysis? Yes. Okay. Are there any, could we enact any of these recommendations locally rather than needing state? Is there anything that the city can do without the state? No, all, I mean, all, all, the, all the elements of the tax system that are so problematic and everything else about it are in the real property tax law, and so there's nothing that we can, there's nothing that we can change locally. And does Albany need the city's permission to reform the property tax? Well, that's a existential question. Um, I... I think our feeling is, I think, that if we as a city, meaning uh, the administration and the council, I say us and I get confused sometimes about who I'm talking about, the administration and the city council uh, go to Albany with a plan that we all support, uh, then that increases the chance of getting that proposal through the, through the legislature and the governor, uh, 
you know, exponentially. When do you think the mayor would go public with a position on this issue? So, one of the things that we have been working on is updating the analysis. Uh, the analysis is essentially based on uh, data before the pandemic. Um, updating the analysis requires access, to, in order to do the income matching that's part of the analysis, we, we need data from the IRS, which typically, it, which is actually coming in a little bit slower than normal right now. So, to really fully update uh, the analysis, uh, to replicate the analysis that was done in 2021 would take us a few months. And by the time we get the data and kind of run all the models again. So, I, you know, my expectation is I'd li I really would like to try and understand better sort of how this looks different now and what that means for the proposal and whether that means you might change some of the proposal uh, parameters. So I think, you know, we're looking at the spring before we would probably have uh, confidence in coming forward with a set of recommendations, but. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm sensitive to folks thinking we're continuing to kick the can, obviously. So. I, I, I completely understand that. Um, and I, again, I just think it's critical that we all can look at this and feel like we understand what's going on in a very deep way, and I'm hesitant to go forward without making sure that we sort of incorporate it. At the end of the day, maybe things have not changed enough that you would change anything in the proposal um, uh, from what it was uh, in the Advisory Commission's final report. But I don't know that, you know, I, I, I want to feel more confident, I guess, that that is the case before we move forward. Is I mean, is there something that is there something, what's the number one thing you, 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 what's the number one issue you think would be different post-COVID? I, I, I think that we need to understand sort of what's going on within this new residential class one, given that there've been a, a lot of uh, changes in the residential market during the pandemic that are now sort of evening out a little bit, but it's left some of the markets in a somewhat different place. And, um, uh, I think we also have to take into account the effect of rising uh, mortgage rates on property values. So, you know, what was revenue neutral may not be revenue neutral if we didn't model the same proposals right now. So we have to, I think we just need to look at all of that um, and figure out, you know, whether or not there are big changes. The other major issue, I think, is the valuation of class four commercial property, um, you know, and whether the, continued office vacancy rates, for example, uh, are gonna result in uh, lower values for office buildings uh, at some point going forward. Uh, under the current system, the caps that limit the assessment growth of class one properties are widely considered to have led to inequities among class one properties, and many consider this to be one of the major flaws uh, of the current system. In your estimation, would the commission's blueprint, if it were implemented, resolve the inequities caused by the, the assessment caps? Yes. Uh, in, if implemented as proposed, um, you'd essentially have one effective tax rate across all properties that would be modified only to the extent that um, you had a phase out of the homestead exemption at a certain level and you had a reduction in taxes uh, uh, by, from the circuit breaker so it would be a more graduated, uh, dare I say, progressive um, uh, tax uh, system than the one we currently have where median tax rates tend to sort of peak in the middle of the, of the income range and then decline. And the current system requires that co-ops and condos be valued by DOF as if they were rentals. This has also been cited as one of the major flaws with the current system for, for myriad reasons. Do you agree that's the state laws governing the assessment of co-ops and condos is one of the most pressing, pressing issues with the city's property tax. Yes, it's one of the, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of bizarre feature and I'm sure that somebody thought it was a good idea at the time, but it, it's hard to justify, I think, in terms of how the properties are used uh, compared to class one, which are used for the same purpose and are you know taxed in a completely different way. If, if a co-op or condo 
owner doesn't understand the va their value under the current system, who can they ask? God help them. Um, well, we have a guide. <laughs> uh, Just one? We have a guide for class one and for class two that you know attempts to lay out and explain uh, how values are arrived at. There is you know information in the statement of account that you know may or may not be helpful. We've been actually revisiting our statement of account to try and make it clearer and simpler for folks, um, which we hope will roll out in the spring. Statement of account, new statement of account in the spring. Next year. Um, so, uh, sorry, sorry. What was the question? <laughs> if a co-op or condo owner doesn't understand, oh, yeah, the yeah. so there, I mean, there is a guide. Uh, you know, there are guides on our website that try to lay this out. Uh, and you know, if you if you call the Department of Finance, we will try and explain your bill to you. Uh, we do a lot of outreach sessions where we have people come out who will try and explain the bills. Um, it, it's just inherently so complex that it's not, I, I think, easy to explain or understand for anybody. Is that, I, is I that look at my own listed? tax bill for my building and I'm sometimes what is it, What's the phone number? Uh, I don't know that I know the phone number off the top of my head, but we'll get it to you. Marianne knows it. Marianne knows it. She calls it all the time. We, I mean, you, obviously you start with 311, but. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. Tell them I'm going to call three and ones like a curse. I, I will. Uh, we will get you a number or a, an email. <laughs> okay. Email. Um, part of the reason why property tax is so high in our city is that a lot of the property tax is exempt, which shifts the burden onto properties that are not exempt. So, while we get a lot of benefits from the institutions that these tax breaks help support, um, I'm not saying these tax breaks are not worth it, but but there, it's definitely a cause of the inequity. Has the administration considered approaching large, wealthy nonprofit institutions like Columbia or Mount Sinai and others about paying a voluntary pilot? It's part of what we are looking at about whether that is an approach that we think makes sense and if so, who, what. I mean, so there are a lot of exempt organizations and kind of drawing, drawing the line about who you ask and who you don't ask is a little bit complicated. Um, the, the commission made a recommendation for a kind of public service fee, uh, which is si similar public service fees or pilots have been negotiated in other large cities with nonprofits um, in recognition of the fact that there are services that they benefit from, you know, basic city services that they benefit from. So it's tagged to some percentage of what their property taxes would be based on their assessed value. But this is part of what we're looking at. Um, I don't know that we've reached a, we have not reached a conclusion yet about that. And I mean, last question, and then I want to turn it to my colleagues. Um, I, I guess the, the issue for a lot of us is that it, it, for, for, for folks in, in the outer boroughs who've been paying too much for too long and subsidizing the system, it doesn't, it doesn't help them if, you know, a, a, a homeowner in Diker Heights who's paying more in property taxes than a homeowner in Park Slope. It doesn't help them if suddenly the guy in Park Slope is paying more. There's no joy. I mean, sure, there's maybe a, a minute of joy, but then you go and you read your bill and you're still paying the same property tax. So wouldn't you say that for the homeowners that have been paying too much for too long, their property tax should be coming down, whereas the homeowner in Park Slope should finally be paying what they should have been paying for 40 years? How do we make that happen? So the commission's recommendations actually made that happen um, because there's essentially uh, uh, revenue neutrality within this new residential class. You're going to see actually a majority of properties and almost three quarters of, uh, of homeowners would see a decrease in their tax bill. Um, you know, our concern is that some of that gets shifted onto properties that are rented. Uh, and so the, the burden gets shifted onto renters ultimately. And that's problematic, but the, the the leveling out of the effective tax rates across uh, uh, property, properties within the same new class is a you know critical core feature, and as I say, as, as proposed by the uh, commission, it would result in tax cuts of, you know, on, on average around 30 percent for three-quarters of homeowners, and it's those homeowners who have largely been 
affected by, you know, or, or not, not enjoyed the benefits of the AV growth caps over the years. And last thing, do you think it needs to stay, do you agree with it needing to stay revenue neutral? I, I think that's a decision to be made. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the, I've always said tax reform is easy if you have $5 billion a year to throw around. Um, I, I think that if you wanted to raise revenues, we just have to think through who's going to pay it. And if we're going to redesign the system, you know, we all already, I think, believe that class two is, rental buildings are heavily taxed. Uh, certainly the owners of commercial buildings think that their buildings are he too heavily taxed. Um, you know, there's, everybody's going to have some objection when, if you were to follow the, the outline of the commission's proposals, you'd set the initial tax rates, right? You could do that kind of as you wanted, uh, and you could raise or reduce revenues if you wanted to. So I don't know that we have a, I think revenue neutrality is easier in the sort of sense of path of least resistance. Uh, but it also creates, as we said, winners and losers, and that can be, uh, you know, that will be a source of political friction, obviously, in adopting any change. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Council Member Carr for questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, you know, I think uh, my community has so often been used as kind of an exemplar of uh, those who are kind of on the inequi iniquitous end of this uh, property tax system that it just goes without saying that they're desperate for relief. And, and one of the reasons why I was so excited when this blueprint came out from the commission end of last year is that it seemed to provide a roadmap for them getting that relief and that seems to be what your testimony uh, affirms and I've seen the testimony of the independent budget office who are coming later, they say the same thing. And so I'm concerned that this dilemma that you raise with respect to, you know, renters and how they may be affected by these needed changes, that this reform process is going to become hostage to an irreconcilable difference of interests. And so I'm just wondering how you think that could happen, right? Because Albany comes back in session in January, and I'd love for all of us with the United Voice up there saying, let's do something here, let's do something along these lines, but you're saying there's more work that needs to be done, and you talked about updating the analyses and whatnot. But when do we start getting in the room together to talk about how we fix that? And, and I want to piggyback off what the chair was saying. How married are we to this revenue neutrality? Because, and you talked about raising revenues. I'm fine with giving tax cuts to everyone. No shocker to anything, anyone here. But how do, we, how do we work this out? So let me start with the question of revenue neutrality. That's fundamentally a decision for you all to make. Um, and, you know, when you make it, we'll incorporate it into the design uh, and the initial tax rates. That's sort of, from, from our perspective, in terms of the structural reform, that's, you know, ex exogenous to that particular um, decision, is pretty exogenous to the structural reforms. The, uh, you know, in terms of the timeline and the, and the dilemmas that we look at here, these, these are, you know, we're, we're trying to understand, essentially, are there solutions what, what are the, what's the framework for solutions? How much does it break the mold that the commission laid out? So, you know, it's very hard to sort of reconcile uh, some of the uh, disparities between homeowners and renters that this might create uh, within the new residential class uh, without sort of reducing, without sort of shifting some of the burden back onto homeowners. So, and I, I don't, I think we all think it's, an important feature to take into account homeowners who have been relatively overtaxed over the years and make sure that they are not relatively overtaxed going forward. Um, yeah, yeah, because my concern is that, you know, for, for years this system has existed. For years it's punished property owners like the ones I represent. Um, and it's just unacceptable that that be considered to be a, a status quo that can extend into the future, even the near future. Um, because it's, it's clearly hurting them. It's clearly forcing them out of their homes. There's sales, and then that's looking, they're looking to recoup those losses over the years with higher sale prices, and yep. so it's less affordable of a community to the incoming class of homeowners. And so, again, like, I, I just like, what's your timeline here for when we can actually start putting together these tweaks that you're suggesting and then maybe consider them and maybe then take a united package up to Albany because... If, we th if folks think that we're slow in this chamber, in this level of government, uh, you know, Albany has 
can set records in that regard. So I just like to know when are we really going to start to see some action and it's beyond just talking about a report that frankly has been available to the public and to all of us for some time now. Right. So I think a, a couple of things. One, I mean, now that the election is over, obviously, it means that there's a more settled political environment in which to do things in Albany. So that's plus, obviously. Um, I think uh, w we, and by we, I mean all of us, including the, most importantly the city council, need to understand the full implications of what we're proposing. So we're, we've been working through analyses to try and deepen our understanding of the implications. Um, I highlighted a couple of you know items that we've come to appreciate. Uh, and I think we just want to make sure that we have a full kind of analysis to present to you all and then talk through and at that point come up with some recommendations. I, I, in an ideal world, council member, I really would like to see us update the analysis to reflect the last couple of years, but I think, you know, we could begin to talk sooner about the shape of reform, um, but I think we would like to come to you with, you know, a full analytic package so that, you know, you all can really make sure you, your questions that you're going to have are answered and that we have some proposals for how we would deal with some of the issues that we've raised. I appreciate that, Commissioner, but again, there's, so there's no timeline. You can't give me ballpark weeks, months, early next year. I mean, that's really what I'm looking to hear from you yeah. at this point. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to commit to a firm timeline, but it will be certainly, uh, it, it will certainly not be later than next year. We'll certainly have something. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Next, we have uh, Council Members Barron and then Brewer. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this issue has been a powerful, long issue, and I noticed the commission makeup, even though you have a couple of blacks on the, as ex officio officers, but the inequity starts with the commission itself. Only one black and one Latina. That starts the inequity. And then out of that, we have to count on the majority white commission, excluding the ex officio member, even though we're majority in New York City now, uh, overwhelming majority. I think a lot of um, policies come when we put commissions like that together, this is what we get. First, um, we're not touching class four not even considering anything for those on commercial property, not the small business owners, but Madison Square Garden pays what, zero uh, taxes. The problem is the tax abatements that allow, the tax breaks that allow. If you didn't give these breaks out, if these breaks weren't given out, we don't have to do anything to hurt property owners. I remember in 2003 when Bloomberg was here, and um, we had a budget mod to do in November, and they said it's a $2.1 billion shortfall, and you either raise property tax or cut $2.1 billion more from the budget, seniors and youth. We already were cut to the bone in June. A lot of us didn't appreciate those cuts, so then it came before us, well, we have a $2.1 billion shortfall. Bloomberg wanted to raise it 30%, and the council compromised at 18% for the property tax hike. And these things happen because the rich corporations get a break. They get 421A, didn't do no real affordable housing, but they had tax breaks. If we would have said, keep your affordable housing, pay your taxes, we could have took, taken their tax money and put into a real affordable housing fund and help us all. But anytime we come up with these propositions and make it appear as though, okay, we're going to give a little break for class one and class two, but we ain't going to mess with uh, class four, unacceptable. That's unacceptable. I think that we should make those who have more pay more, and that we should consider a real property tax system that doesn't punish homeowners. A lot of us had to go back to our communities and say, look, uh, either we raise the property tax or we're going to lose the senior citizen program, we're going to lose the, so the youth program, and even our property tax. 
our property owner said, okay, we'll sacrifice because we don't want that to happen. In a city that has a $101 billion budget and um, uh, $8.3 billion in a reserve fund, we sitting here cutting city agencies by 3%, and cutting education, two, three hundred million, bloated police budget, 11 billion, and then we, we come up with this. I know Commissioner Starks years ago recommended that we reduce the 6% for class one down to 3.5% permanently to, to reduce that, and that would uh, be very, very helpful. But when I look through this and I see all the contradictions, uh, I'm just concerned that we as a council don't go along to get along or you even to get along with your boss and, and we need to come forth with something that truly makes those who make more pay more. And this system, when you put a commission like this together, uh, Mark Shaw, <laughs> I remember Mark Shaw, when you put a, a commission like that together, uh, you know what's going to come out of it, and the rich get richer year after year, the poor get poorer, and then you try to make a little break for the poor, struggling people, but this, this doesn't get it. You know, we have to do something around the, the real property tax, and I know the state has a lot to do with that, but we have to go beyond, we're up against the wall, so we're going to have to raise property tax in the event a shortfall comes. And I just see, reading through a lot of this, a lot of our people won't even understand a lot of it because they're just trying to, you know, make ends meet. But in, the fact of the matter is the rich protect the rich and the poor get shafted in these kinds of proposals. So I just want to hear your comments or some of that. I, I, I think that the Commission's recommendations actually go a tremendous distance in terms of uh, benefiting um, uh, communities that have been, uh, relatively speaking, overtaxed for many years, so, and, and raising the rate on those that have been undertaxed. The sort of equalization, both horizontally and vertically, in terms of equity, is very substantial. Uh, it's true that that's all within sort of what the residential class that it right. creates, um, and there was no, uh, there were no changes proposed to class four, and I, right. you know, there was no discussion of sort of the tax incentives programs that currently right. exist. All of that's, you know, something I think for us to discuss going forward. Right, but that's not true that it, it really did all of that to try to get equity. We're nowhere near equity. And I think sometimes these gradual um, proposals that give the appearance of, yeah, there's some reduction and all of that, but that's not gonna make any substantive major changes in how business is done. And so oftentimes we're given these um, reductions and a little more for this and a little less for that, but the bottom line is not substantive enough. It's not full of substance. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, I just, uh, we're going to turn to uh, Councilmember Brewer. I just want to ask: Is there on the web, on the DOF website right now? Could a homeowner co-op condo owner find the formula for how DOF evaluates properties? Uh, I mean, it's in our guide, and I think if you go and you look at your uh, notice of property value, I think it's laid out there. So, yeah, so, so I could if I I could look up. How do you get to my bill? And it'll. If you go to the list. property taxes section on the website, you know there's a my, there's a uh, your property lookup. Right. Okay. Councilmember Brewer. Thank you. Um, I think you know, and you talked about it a little bit with renters. Like almost 69% of us rent renters in New York, and so you talked about it a little bit. I just want to understand a little bit more because you got two kinds of renters. You got the market renters, and then you have the rent regulated renters. And so I'm just wondering how you think this would impact both. You talked about the market, but this would mean that RGB would have some, hopefully, input into their lowering the rent or not increasing the rent in terms of per percentage. And then I guess there are some cities, and I don't know this, that have a circuit breaker to renters 
to help them because um, uh, renters need help. So I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit on how you think this would improve, if at all, the ability to rent in the city. As I said, I think one of our main concerns here is really about, well, I mean, first of all, the larger rental buildings, such as those on the Upper West Side, are not affected at all by, there, there were no proposed changes there. So no change in rent burdens there. Um, I think we're concerned about smaller buildings, uh, the class 2A and 2B, four to 10 unit rental buildings, and even those two and three family homes where there's a rental unit um, and, no, uh, and no owner present could see tax increases, uh, which you know, in an unregulated environment means th they could easily get passed on in whole or in part to the renters themselves. So I think that's, you know, for us, that's an issue that we need to um, uh, examine a little bit more fully and we will want to present to you sort of our analysis of that and uh, you know, we're looking for some to think about how to address uh, that problem because I, we agree that a system that uh, adversely affects the you know, over two thirds of uh, residents of the city who are renters is not, not a great fix. Okay, so. but even the ones that are not affected, I have to say the rents are huge. I know people are moving every month to be able to avoid, the, I guess you call it the post-pandemic rent. Yeah. So I just think we need a little bit more discussion generally on renters. Could they see anything that would be of assistance to them? And is there some other structure? I don't know. But it seems to me with 68, 69% of people renting in the city, a little bit more focus should, should be on that. The other thing is I know nobody's talking about commercial rent tax, that unfair tax in Manhattan. Did that come up at all in any of these discussions? Council Member Powers and I hate it. <laughs> uh, the commercial rent tax it was not part of the discussion of the commission, in, to my understanding, because it's not part of the property tax system per se. Well, it is if it, they get stuck with it. Yes, so they do get stuck with it. I mean, I think now it is, uh, it, 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 because of the changes that were enacted a few years ago, uh, when Council Member Gorodnik, who also hated it, uh, was here, uh, the largely falls on larger firms. It's not really, it doesn't fall on a lot of small businesses. Well, super, supermarkets get hit with it badly, just. Uh, and it falls on a, you know, it falls on businesses in Manhattan. Yes, I am um, aware of that. And so, you know, you can, you, there have been proposals to eliminate it, reduce it, et cetera. It brings in $900 million a year, so that's a consideration. Okay, all right. Um, to be discussed further. Yep. Uh, we know how many folks don't pay their taxes, what the number is. Do we, how does that number figure, figure into this? Uh, there is a small percentage, usually, um, of people who get behind in their taxes. Uh, as you know, we currently don't have an enforcement mechanism uh, for people who don't pay their taxes. Um, we are looking at a proposal for how to help people who can't pay their taxes while still managing to enforce against people who aren't, don't, won't pay their taxes. Um, so the, you know, the, I think the overall delinquency rate is at about three and a half percent right now. So it's about, about where it usually is um, at this point in the year. Does that uh, translate to a number? Yes, uh, about a billion dollars. Okay. And the other question I have in terms of co-ops and condos, as time goes on with these discussions, would we be able to have some examples? I'm obviously interested in Manhattan, um, how one would be paying under the current system versus the new system, because it's fine to talk about it, but it's not clear that there would be a reduction if you're in this new class one, which seems to make sense to me. Right. But I mean, it's, it's hard to know. And that's what I think, you know, one of the things that we've been working on here is a more just detailed, fine-grained presentation of uh, the changes um, to show some geographical impact, to show sort of some, you know, examples. I go with the, whatever Marianne Wathman says, I go <laughs> with, just so you know. Um, and then just finally, this issue of um, living in the building prime. Um, I would obviously love to tax more the pied de terres. That never seems to work in Albany. Is there some reason for that? I, I don't know what the reason is. Um, that was mentioned in the commission's report as a possible revenue source. Uh, you know, again, sort of outside the, the pied de terre tax has a couple of different 
configurations. Usually it's in the form of a transfer, a higher transfer tax. Okay. Um, the proposal that has been in Albany the last couple of years uh, has been one that uh, would actually raise the tax rate. Um, I mean, we give homeowners co-op condo abatement, star, et cetera, we give them, there is in effect a higher tax rate on Piera, on, you know, non-owner occupied. Because they occupied. don't get that rate, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, that's certainly, uh, I, I can't tell you the reasons why it hasn't gone anywhere in, in Albany, I don't know. Okay, and then how will you know maybe uh, that somebody really is living in the apartment, since we can't figure out how many vacancies we have for warehousing? I mean, how do you actually know that? Is that something that you know now? Would it have to be clarified, et cetera? Because I see a lot of cheaters out there. Yeah. I mean, we, we do try to ensure that, uh, you know, people are getting what they're entitled to and not more. Uh, we sent out uh, letters not long ago to around 5,000 taxpayers um, f for whom we had some doubts about whether they were actually residents. And... Uh, asked them to confer, affirm that they were residents with some proof and we got back a fairly small number of people. And so those tax abatements were revoked for people who didn't respond, so. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then some people came in and responded after their tax was revoked, of course, but you know, we, we try to reach everybody. Just wanna note we've been joined by council members Farias and Ressler. I now wanna turn to council members Brooks Powers and then Ose for questions. Thank you, Chair, and hi, Commissioner Annie Black. Hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again as well. Um, I know you know where I stand on the property taxes, but just for the record, I just want to say that communities like Southeast Queens get hammered with property taxes. In my district, I have I'm predominantly home ownership, which have the one and two family homes as well as condominiums. I'm also concerned about when you change the class for the condominiums, what that impact may be for a condominium that's like 300 homeowners and less. Um, so that that's one. But in terms of the questions that I have, I want to start with, I'd like you to walk the committee through the targeted relief programs for homeowners that the report recommends. So in your report, you propose two competing options for an exemption structure, the partial homestead exemption and the graduated marginal rate exemption. Can you explain the advantages or disadvantages of each of these structures? Well, I, I have to admit I'm partial to the flat rate exemption. The, the way that that would work is that 20% of the uh, of the property's value would be exempt from taxation. So now we're on sales-based market value, right? So if your property is assessed at $500,000, you would be paying taxes on 400,000, right? Did I do the math right? Yes. Um, the, uh, uh, that would, be uh, fully in effect up to a income of 370 household income of 375,000, and then a decreasing percentage would be exempt up to an income of $500,000. The uh, graduated rate exemption, which I don't know that I could as easily recite from memory, uh, is more complex, and I think it's it creates uh, it creates some distortions and some complexity that I, you know, both in administration and for taxpayers, um, and you kind of constantly have to revisit income. It, it's, it's a much more, it, it can create sort of jumps in the valuation uh, that's taxed um, if income changes from year to year. So I, I, you know, I think it's, it's not, there's a lot to be said for simplicity uh, and clarity, and I think the, uh, the structure of the Tax, the flat rate tax exemption, so-called flat rate tax exemption, uh, has enough progressivity in it, and you can see it. You know, if you look at effective tax rates uh, below 375 and above 500, you can see that effective tax rates are higher on incomes above 500,000 under reform uh, because of it. So I, I think it's a it's a straightforward mechanism that uh, doesn't result in any cliffs and is uh, fairly easy for taxpayers to understand. In, in terms of um, the recommendations outlined in the report, um, changing the type of relief lower income homeowners receive currently, are there certain lower income homeowners who would pay more under this new system? So a moment ago I was talking to my colleague, Council Member Hudson, and we're talking about legacy homeowners as we spoke about before. And just wanting to know if there may be you know, a blind spot in this space in terms of the impact 
on certain lower income homeowners? Yes, it's possible. And I think there, we, there are some neighborhoods where there would be a substantial number of properties that you, even with the circuit breaker and the exemption, at least as proposed, um, you'd still see uh, homeowners who have a fairly high burden in terms of their income, so more than, you know, substantially more than 10%. E they, even though their taxes might go down, some of their taxes may go up. And again, I think that that's one of the, uh, one of the concerns that, that we have that I didn't really discuss in detail, but this sort of problem of excess burdened uh, taxpayers uh, is one that I think we need to kind of figure out as well, because as we mentioned, there are substantial numbers of homeowners who would see very substantial increases, uh, even under reform, even with the targeted homeowner relief. Uh, so I think, you know, part of the discussion we all need to have is sort of how to address that problem. So I have two quick questions I'm gonna ask you because I know I'm running out of time, but I would love to have the answer. One, last, week, last week's election, voters adopted amendments to the city charter, which added a preamble to the charter to include language around building a quote unquote, just and equitable city for all and require the city agencies create racial equity plans. The Charter Revision Commission specifically called out race neutral decision making as often exacerbating racial disparities as racial impacts are ignored. Based on this, do you believe it is appropriate for the city to understand the racial impact on property tax reform? And then the last question I have for you is, coming out of the pandemic, the new level of sustained popularity of hybrid remote work options has led to heightened levels of commercial vacancies, clouding the future of many commercial properties. Does the administration anticipate the current high vacancy environment will lead to a new normal for the city's commercial property assessment base? If so, are there reforms to the property tax system that the administration would suggest to reflect the new normal? And thank you. Yep, so with respect to the racial equity question, uh, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, there's obviously been their analysis and I think everybody understands that there is a racial dimension to the inequities that are built into the system. Um, you know, as I said, we're, we're trying to sort of deepen the analysis here to go down, you know, into a deeper, deeper level so that every council member can kind of look at their district and understand what the implications would be as well as citywide. Um, and I think in general, those disparities in the commission's proposal would be largely eliminated as they exist today. And that's, again, I mean, I think that's a huge, a huge selling point and a huge benefit uh, to the reform structure that was proposed. Um, so I, I think we would, we would actually end up taking a big step forward in terms of racial equity uh, if we were to go in the general direction that the, the commission has proposed. Um, office vacancies is a bit of a, a challenge for us right now. You know, we're, we're seeing um, w the information that we get from uh, uh, commercial property owners uh, is lagged. Um, so the information that we're using for this coming tax year is from last year. So we're not seeing yet in those, in the real property income and expense statements, um, big or sustained vacancy rates, but I think we're starting to see some evidence of that. I don't have a, we're not in the model, we're not in the business of forecasting. Uh, we're just, you know, trying to figure out like what's, what's it worth today? Uh, but I think, you know, it's not hard to see that, especially in the office market, there's going to be, and, and in retail, there's going to be some challenges going ahead if vacancy rates uh, continue at their current level. And that, you know, it's, we take that into account in assessments. Um, and so, you know, assessments will, if there's sustained vacancy rates, assessments will start to go down and taxes will start to go down. Uh, on the relatively speaking, at least, to their uh, current level. So I think, um, you, you know, this is an area that we'll be watching on. And when we release the tentative role in January, we'll comment on certainly what sort of what we're seeing. Councilmember Rose? 
Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Commissioner. I do want to follow up or dig deeper a little bit about my, my colleague's past question in terms of legacy residents. I represent uh, Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, and I'm interested in how these reforms will be equitable uh, to these small homeowners, especially our seniors um, who are living on fixed incomes, for example, retirement, no increase in wages. Uh, how is this process, or how are these reforms going to be more equitable for them? I think this is one of the areas where I think there are some challenges in reform. Um, a neighborhood like Bed-Stuy, which has seen rapid growth in market values, but not necessarily for people who have been in their homes for a long time, they haven't seen their incomes grow at nearly the rate that their uh, market values are growing. So that, that means the burden of income tax, uh, property taxes rather is increasing on them. It also means because of the assessed growth caps on assessed value that they are among the relatively undertaxed right now and under reform, you know, neighborhoods like that could see their taxes go up. And I think that this is one of the challenges that we need to uh, look at very carefully and understand, you know, how we're going to address uh, legacy homeowners like that. And, and is the Department of Finance looking into those cases and... I mean, we're, we're, you know, as I said, we're, we're trying to dig down and really get as much detail uh, without becoming, you know, just going line by line through each mm -hmm. address, uh, get as much detail as we can, detailed understanding as we can of the impacts uh, on different kinds of homeowners in different neighborhoods. And, you know, when we have, when we have what we think uh, are sufficient uh, analysis here to answer you know many of the questions that you all will have we will we will bring those forward thank you I appreciate that um, maybe you answered this already in, in your past answer but how will the homestead exemption provide relief to such homeowners as well I mean the home homestead exemption and in particular the circuit breaker are important uh, dimensions of how you achieve sort of uh, uh, help for uh, homeowners who are sort of, if you will, house rich and cash poor. Mm. So uh, there's just a question right now of, you know, how do you design a circuit breaker? Uh, is the circuit breaker as proposed by the commission sufficient? You know, are those the right parameters? Uh, and who does, who does it help? Who does it not help? Uh, and then we want to try and dig deeper into that. But the circuit breaker, circuit breaker is a common feature and the one that was designed by the Commission makes a lot of sense in, in general outline. We just want to make sure we fully understand the, um, you know, who benefits and, and who needs more help potentially. Absolutely. Something that's usually a, a main concern for me and my constituents is whenever, you know, there's government reforms, um, you know, get passed through the council or any body of government, um, which benefit, you know, homeowners or just people of, of our city. Um, the outreach seems to, to be lacking. Maybe it only resides online. And, you know, again, I, I do represent a, a district with a decent amount of seniors who may not be as tech savvy, but if you could go into what the educational outreach for these new reforms would look like, I would appreciate that. Well, we'll have to have the reforms first and then we can right. talk about the outreach. But uh, I, I will say that in general, you know, outreach has been somewhat inhibited over the last couple of years. Um, because of the inability to do in person and we've been frustrated by that and we're really ha we have a strong outreach team uh, headed by C Assistant Commissioner Jackie Gold um, who uh, uh, d are, whose enthusiasm is unmatched and they will go out rain or shine day or night you know into any event in any community uh, and try and be helpful um, and we will I, I, I can only imagine that when we actually pass a tax reform, new tax law, property tax law, that there's going to be uh, a lot of discussion about how we're going to inform people. It's going to be very important. Thank you, Commissioner. And those are all of my questions. Just, again, want to hammer in on the point of when you do uh, come to a conclusion on your analysis of, you know, those, those homeowners that, you know, reside in Prospect Heights and Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. You know, I think when we think about brownstone homeowners, we obviously uh, deem them to be wealthy or upper middle class. And um, there are a lot of, you know, hardworking black New Yorkers that, uh, you know, are, again, are living on fixed incomes uh, that are being impacted by 
steep property taxes and um, are potentially selling their homes to, to anyone that comes knocking on their doors. So I would really appreciate that information when you, when you get it. Thank yeah, you. No, we, and we certainly completely understand the problem. So we... Uh, Council Member Sanchez on Zoom. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and Commissioner, thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us today. Um, so I actually wanted to continue both Council Member Brewer and Council Member Brooks Powers line of questioning around you know, racial equity and, and rentals. Um, so in a, in a report uh, several years ago by the Regional Plan Association, they proposed uh, a rent credit as a way to deal with the disparity um, that uh, renters face in the city of New York. Um, and by the way, I'm trying to start my video, but, but the host has to let me. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, my first question is whether the administration would be supportive of a rent credit for renters as a way to deal with the um, the unequal tax burden that they face and that is difficult to sort of, um, you know, get at through other policies, would, would you support a rent credit? Thank you for that, Councilmember Sanchez. I, and I'd say great to see you, but it's great to hear you at least. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so as I mentioned, the commission didn't make a proposal. Um, the, the problem about rent credit is part for renters as part of the property tax system is, you know, you, you, ha you can only give the credit to the property tax owner on their taxes and you don't really have any mechanism for ensuring that it gets passed through to the renters. So uh, the normal way that this, uh, that relief is given to low and moderate income renters is through a personal income tax credit, uh, and that's done in a lot of jurisdictions. Um, the uh, commission did not, the commission said that was outside essentially of the property tax system, and so they were therefore not making a recommendation about it. Uh, it is something we want to look at. It costs money, and we have to, again, we have to figure out, like, you know, w w all the moving parts here, sort of how are you going to pay for it? Is it from, you know, are you going to raise rates? Are you going to, um, and pay for it within the system, or you're going to find an outside source, et cetera. So those are the questions that we want to look at, um, and we need to also understand. You know, the meaningful relief uh, can be uh, can be costly overall. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars, and so we just need to really kind of tackle that question and figure out how we're going to address that. Right. Absolutely. And and the RPA report did specifically recommend uh, for for the relief to come through the income tax. So. Um, that, that would be a good, a good line of discussion to, to continue to have with us. Um, okay, and then my, my next question is about Section 581, which makes high-end co-ops and condos, you know, remain undervalued. Would the administration be in support of repealing that section wholesale? I, I think uh, you, repealing one section of the real property tax law is a partial solution and it doesn't address all of the inequities. So it doesn't necessarily address the problem that are created by AV caps. If you get rid of Section 80, uh, 581, are you going to have caps on the assessed value growth in co-ops and condos? Or are you going to go to market value? Or how are you going to how are you going to value them? And how does that mm -hmm. compare to class one, one to three family homes, the treatment of them in the tax system? So I think, you know, we'd rather take a more wholesale approach, which is more complicated and challenging, but, but which I think, you know, we, our goal is to really come up with a system that is fundamentally more equitable, simpler, more transparent uh, to understand. And I, I think we think, you know, doing this piecemeal isn't going to get us there. Got it. Thank you. And I mean, that was my, my last question, and I think you answered it, but are there any smaller reforms that uh, that the administration would think would be um, productive if we can't get at a comprehensive reform with the state? Uh, I'm going to say that I'm not prepared to answer that question yet because I'm still holding out for uh, wholesale reform. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. And thank you. Thank you so much for maintaining eye contact with the name on the screen. Really appreciate it. <laughs> um, sure. and, and thank you, Chair, for allowing me to ask questions. Thank you. So we have Council Members Ressler and then Powers. Thank you so much, Chair Brannon and Commissioner. It's good to see you. And I want to thank 
you and your team uh, at DOF and, and thank this administration and the previous administration and this council and the previous council for their leadership on this issue. And I especially want to just shout out Controller Lander who has, I think, been leading the charge and highlighting the extreme inequities that exist in our property tax system. Uh, some of my constituents are among the folks that benefit the most uh, from these inequities. I represent uh, parts of Brownstone, Brooklyn. Uh, and I'd like you to help me think about how to communicate to them about some of the changes that are needed. You know, the commission proposal calls for transitioning to this new system over five years. Is five years sufficient to protect property owners who are facing significant tax increases? Um, should the length of that phase in be proportional to the size of the increase to help property tax, to help protect homeowners against potentially massive increases in their, t in their property tax bills? So the question of the transition and uh, time is, I mean, I think, you know, five years was a kind of reasonable uh, balance between people uh, who, you know, really want reform right now and want to see their tax, believe they're overpaying and want to see their taxes lowered, and people who might face increases uh, and who you want to uh, phase in gently as possible. I, as I said, I do think that there are some uh, households that are going to see increases that are very substantial and that five years, you know, may not be enough. And we, and we do have to think about some, uh, how we're going to address that. We have to get a handle on sort of how big, how much, and think about what it would cost. I don't, in general, I'd rather avoid a, a sort of differential phase in rates just because it becomes nightmarishly complex and it gets, uh, it makes people feel as if they're not being treated equitably uh, and equally in the reform. So rather, I think, take the approach of having one phase in rate and then trying to address sort of the extremes that, that where, the, uh, where the phase in will nonetheless, after five years, leave people substantially worse off than they were. I think it will be a hard argument to make to folks in our community, but I'm open to trying to help think through solutions for the folks that are really facing some extreme increases and how to phase that in in a reasonable fashion. Fair, uh, and I think we, we, you know, we, we want to keep in dialogue, continue to have a dialogue with you all about that because we, we recognize the issue. You know, I mentioned the Brownstone Brooklyn folks in our community who would probably face some serious uh, challenges with uh, the commission's recommendation or face some serious uh, costs uh, with the commission's recommendations. Uh, constituents of mine in South Williamsburg are uh, clamoring for these changes. Uh, homeowners in Williamsburg have been paying a disproportionate share of property taxes for years. I know that your colleagues have met with UJO more times than they can count, uh, uh, including some of the folks sitting behind you today. Appreciate your all's patience. Um, but but by DOF's own, by UJO's analysis, DOF has imposed three times as high property taxes on uh, condos in South Williamsburg um, compared to uh, the values of similar homes. And, you know, because of the totally distorted ways in which we compare condos, uh, condo taxes to rentals. Uh, these are condos that don't have any amenities, are not like the luxury condos in, of the north side of Williamsburg, but get compared to uh, similar rental uh, housing stock up there. Uh, I appreciate that the reforms that the commission has laid out, you know, would address some of these issues, but what steps can the Department of Finance take right now to help home homeowners in South Williamsburg condominiums who are paying extremely high rent uh, tax bills relative to what they should? Uh, I mean, I've, I've also participated in some of these meetings as well as uh, the DOF staff over the years. Uh, I, um, you, you know, we, recognize their points, and I think we have a fundamental disagreement about the sort of the, the, the taxation comparables that are being used. Um, you know, I'm happy to continue. We'll walk you through what we've done, and, and we'll sit, happy to sit down and walk you through it. And I've joined the meetings, and I strongly agree with them. I, and I, you know, when I worked for the previous mayor, I joined these meetings and strongly agreed with them. So I, I, I do think that there are serious issues that we continue to need to work through and address. One issue that I do want to highlight that I'm I've been quite frustrated by is my assembly member Emily Gallagher um, had submitted a FOIL request with UJO, and after many, many rounds of back and forth, um, DOF released, released you know data that was um, 
you know, more blacked out than, you know, some of the, uh, well, I won't get, I won't make comparisons to Trump, but it was profoundly blacked out. Um, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, I don't understand why the Department of Finance will not release the full formula that explains how you're getting to the uh, tax outcomes that you are. Um, taxpayers should have a full accounting for how their properties are being taxed and why, and to make this some, I think, absurd argument of proprietary information undermines transparency and accountability uh, for why people are being taxed. Yeah, unfortunately, the vendor who, what you were blacked out on those, on that file request were screens from the uh, software that's used as part of the computer-aided mass assessment, and the vendor declined to allow us to share them. Uh, so they are proprietary, and I can't legally do anything about that. I think, you know, the, the to, to the extent, you know, that anybody can understand the process, it was laid out uh, clearly um, in the, in what was provided. But, you know, again, happy to sort of walk through it. It's not, it's, it's not a straightforward process. Um, so um, I'm happy to walk through it with anybody and, and, you know, explain how it works to the best that we can. Well, look forward to taking up more of your time to work through these issues because I don't think we've yet reached uh, resolutions that our constituents demand and deserve. I, I just will say uh, your team came out to an event of ours at a middle-income kind of co-op in, uh, in our district and were incredibly helpful and provided great resources to our constituents, and I just want to really appreciate it. So great. thank glad you for that it. and look forward to more events like that in the future. Great. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Councilmember Powers. Thank you. I just want to echo Councilmember Ressler's comment that I also have a district that has uh, been fortunate, I suppose, uh, when it comes to the current tax system. But uh, also, we hear often about the burden on folks as well. And I think uh, any plan that extends that, trans that change uh, would be uh, a much easier uh, for the folks that do have already feel like they're paying uh, a lot and not to undermine the fairness argument of, the, of, of this, but obviously there's a cost to people and they, they deeply need to know it's not gonna hit them all at one time. Um, and sec I had two questions, and I'll just in respect the time. Number one is the issue that Councilman Brewer raised about renters and the impact on rental properties and how that might go down. Obviously there's some protections on folks who are rent regulated about what the, what the change in rents can be, but for folks that are paying high rents in my district, for instance, young families trying to keep Manhattan as their home, trying to send their children here, is there a protection or how, or how would the administration perhaps recommend that renters are protected against a change to the rental property uh, tax, taxes and how that might then be passed along to their rents? Um. I mean, as I said, we don't, the, the commission didn't make a recommendation. We were concerned about the impact on renters of tax reform and, and you know, the position of class two large rental buildings that currently uh, the reform, the commission left untouched. Um, you, you know, the mayor is concerned about the position of renters citywide and I think wants to find a solution for them. I don't have a recommendation for you right now. Um, as I said, the problem about doing it within the property tax system is you can't guarantee that any reduction in taxes gets passed on. So, you know, it probably has to be a mechanism that's outside of the property tax system. We just have to sort of, you know, again, kind of work through the details and, and come up with a proposal that we think works and is uh, uh, affordable in the context of reform. Thank you. I just wanted to go back to something from Councilor Carr earlier when you talked about um, uh, like neutrality of the cost of this. Is it the position of the administration that this should be revenue neutral? Or I know you said it's up to us. It's actually up to the state legislature, and unfortunately, we have to pay for it. Uh, so, who, who is? Uh, what is the position of the administration right now? I, I don't know that we, we we haven't really taken a position about that. I mean, we're, we're so, so I think where we want to end up here is to be able to say to you all, if you want to raise revenues, here are the options for doing that. If you want to lower revenues, you know, here are the options for doing that. Um, 
and I think we just want to understand, you know, how we would go about it, who would who would pay less, who would pay more. I think, you know, we don't necessarily, we're not wedded to revenue neutrality, but we are wedded to doing an analysis so that we fully understand the consequences of what we do. Right. Understood. My, my concern is that though those who do not have to pay for it may perhaps take the expensive route to, uh, to solving the problem. Um, I had one more question. We have the city controller here, and he, I think we'll be hearing from him shortly. He's proposed a property tax reform um, that the property tax reform should address the issue of 421A tax break, which they say which the higher effective tax burden on rentals versus condos makes it difficult, impossible, or uh, unlikely perhaps to develop rental buildings without in the in absence of a tax break. Idea that yeah, his idea is addressing the disparity would remove a reason for 421A, in turn allowing reform of what of that tax break to be more efficiently creating affordable housing. I don't know if I summed that up, Kemp Controller. Uh, do you guys have a position on that proposal? And uh, I mean, I know 421A or some new iteration of that program is something you guys care about and will be advocating for in Albany, but have you guys evaluated that? Do you have any position on that proposal? I mean, we were big supporters of the governor's proposal, as I said in the last session, and you know, it will be a high priority to get some kind of proposal uh, uh, in the next session. Um, I'm not familiar with all the details of the controller's uh, proposal yet, so I can't comment specifically on it. Um, but uh, you know, we, I, I think we recognize that there's going to be a need for some solution to incentivize the construction of affordable housing, uh, as there has been in the past, and. You know, it can be, it doesn't have to be done with property tax reform, but it has to be taken into account in property tax reform. So uh, I think it would be good to think about them together, even if they don't necessarily act uh, on the same, to go forward on the same timeline. Okay, that's my timer. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Can, can we get DOF to commit to briefing us, say, every quarter on, on an update on where we're at? Sure. Okay. Yes. I mean, ideally, right. I'd, I'd, I'd love to, you know, have the council join with the mayor to go up to Albany and make this a real priority. Uh, I mean, there's there's no other way that we're going to get it done. I think yeah. I agree. So uh, we uh, we absolutely we will. I mean, we we will certainly be as we, you know, wrap up our analysis. We will bring that to you, uh, and then we will start talking with you guys. I mean, this is this is really something that has to be done jointly. I think absolutely. So, all right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank yep. you very much. All right. Thank you. We will now have uh, the controller, Brad Lander. Good morning. Uh, you, please, uh, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm that the testimony you give will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. I do. Uh, I do. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair, for convening this hearing. Uh, council members Ayala and Powers, good to see you, and uh, to the committee council and staff as well. Um, I'm New York City Controller Brad Lander. I'm joined today by our Executive Deputy Controller Francesco Brindisi, who is also uh, much more knowledgeable than I am about the intricacies of this complex property tax system. Um, uh, we have uh, the uh, little PowerPoint presentation, which is now up on the screen. Members, I believe there's hard copies for you, and for members of the public listening, it's available on our website at comptroller.nyc.gov now, and you can look at it uh, there. Um, uh, but I really want to thank you for convening this hearing. Uh, one bit of good news is in many ways we're really building on and in pretty broad alignment with what uh, the administration, the Department of Finance said earlier. Um, and we think this is a critical moment. This is, as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Chair, such a hard issue to get one's head around and then build a coalition to make political progress on. But there's a few reasons, uh, and if you go to the next slide, that we think this is really a key moment to do it, which is why we're so glad that you're, um, uh, do we have the, uh, 
Um, you know, first, even though it came late in the uh, de Blasio administration with only three days to spare, the advisory commission really does outline the key features for fairness with protections for vulnerable homeowners. Um, 421A exp expiration, I think, is critical. I know you asked uh, Councilmember Powers, and it, it makes sense, you know, can we pin, you know, should 421A be pinned to property tax reform? But realistically, in Albany, I think it's likely to go in the other direction. There's going to be enormous pressure in Albany to do something that makes it, in the eyes of those who do it, possible to develop new multifamily rental housing. And I think the key will be to make sure that property tax reform does not get lost, as it so often does, and those things really have got to be tied together. Um, you know, uh, now the governor and the mayor are both early in their terms. That's a good time to try to do something hard, neither of them facing election for a little while yet, so that's a good time to try to do it. Um, one thing I would say is I don't know that it needs to be that the, the, the city needs to first figure out the proposal. Uh, this is going to take governor, mayor, legislature, city council all collaborating. That is not an easy thing to do. But it may be that there needs to be some form of collaboration and dialogue to develop the proposal, which ultimately will be state legislation. And of course, state legislators, just like each of you, uh, the ones from the city, represent New Yorkers impacted here. Um, and then, obviously, this is a, a good moment, I think, to do two things, and we'll get to this in the, in the proposal, link these long-standing concerns of overtaxed outer borough homeowners, disproportionately homeowners of color, uh, but also let's focus on pathways uh, for new affordable home ownership, something that we really desperately need in the city, and we've got a proposal at the end today that we think can make this a real good opportunity to do that. Um, as you know, there really is a broad coalition uh, here. Next slide, please. Um, I don't think that um, uh, the minority leader, Joe Borelli, and I have ever teamed up on an op-ed before, but we did recently have one in the Daily News on the uh, the reasons why it's time to repair our unjust property tax system. And we put a great coalition together on the day 421A expired that, Mr. Chair, you were at, and we had the chair of the State Senate uh, uh, Finance Committee as well, uh, Liz Kruger. Um, we had folks like me, and, and the Council Member Ressler mentioned this, who um, represent uh, homeowners who are relatively undertaxed. I am a New York City homeowner who is undertaxed in the current system as a result of assessed value cap increases. Um, and yet we are teaming up with folks like Councilmember Riley and Councilmember Borelli and you and folks from Southeast Queens whose homeowners are overtaxed uh, because this is not just uh, about the, the fact that people are, are overtaxed and deserve some relief. This is about the fact that our core revenue, our core property tax is deeply inequitable and you just can't build a city around a fundamentally inequitable tax. So um, over time, my neighbors and I are gonna have to pay something more like our fair share. We need to do that right and thoughtfully, um, but we do need to move forward and do it and that's why there's such a broad coalition of people from all five boroughs, from both parties, from neighborhoods that are both under and overtaxed um, so we're going to outline today uh, the outlines of our proposal on the next slide. Um, and again, what we really think is critical is to link what we, you know, what we think of here as homeowner property tax reform uh, with multifamily property tax reform. Uh, uh, Francesco will go through our perspective on homeowner property tax reform, which is quite largely what you heard from uh, the finance commissioner tax parity among homeowners, a gradual phase in, and thoughtful protections for potentially vulnerable homeowners. We have a couple of thoughts there that build on and go a little further than the commission. And then I'll come back and talk about multifamily property tax reform since I've been tilting at the windmill of 421A for over 20 years now. Um, but we have some thoughts here for multifamily property tax reform that reduces the tax rate on new rental development. Um, uh, it takes a smarter approach to tax breaks for affordable housing. Um, and then in place of the, one of the worst parts of 421A, that 130% AMI program puts in place essentially a, a new model for multifamily affordable cooperatives on the uh, kind of a 21st century Mitchell Lama. So, Francesco. I'm gonna take it next. Uh, so next slide, uh, the, you know, <clears throat> you've heard it from the, the finance commissioner. Um, you know, we're building our proposal on the recommendations of the advisory commission. Um, 
and uh, you know there are good things that uh, the good work that the commission has done and we you know it ha highlighted the disparity in tax treatment because of difference in evaluation um, it, it has a proposal to um, group together the class one currently class one properties co-ops and condos and small rentals mostly and, and value them all at the same in the same with the same methodology <coughs> um, and they are together because they currently have are taxed at the similar median tax rates um, and uh, um, and you know we all know that the system is confusing it's uh, it's very difficult to figure out where where your taxes are coming from and how to calculate them and it's got differences in uh, the tax rates across geographies and, and different properties next um, so, um, you know, as highlighted, um, the, there are uh, currently one, two, three family homes. Class ones are, are um, assessed as if, you know, based on comparable sales, whereas cops and condos are assessed as if, you know, based on comparable rentals. Um, whether that methodology is uh, transparent enough has been uh, asked uh, previously by, by Councilmember Ressler. Um, and uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that this leads to the um, Department of Finance um, evaluating and estimating market values that for cops and condos sort of are on average one-fifth of the true sales based market value and the higher is the value of the property, the lower is this percentage that is captured in the, in the market value um, estimate from the Department of Finance. Um, next. Um, another reason why the, um, the system is uh, complicated is there are fractional assessments uh, and uh, target ratios. So we've heard about the 6% for class one, we've heard about the 45% for uh, you know, class two and three and four. Um, so it's, it's really difficult, you know, even if you knew what your um, value is, uh, you know, how to translate it into, into a tax. And so, you know, that's one thing that, uh, that probably should be, um, should be um, removed from the system in order to make it uh, more transparent. Um, uh, next, please. Um, the growth caps, um, class one and class two small rentals, they're, um, they, they, um, are assessed based on uh, a target ratio of 6% for class one and 45% for the small rentals that are in class two, but their assessed value cannot uh, grow more than 6% in any one year or 20% over five years for class one or 8% in any given year or 30 and 30% over um, five years for the small rentals. So for places where there is a lot of appreciation, of market value, the assessed value captures less and less um, of, the, of that appreciation. And the, and the way that the system works is that that taxation is redistributed towards other um, properties that are not being, um, that, that are not appreciating as much. Um, next. Um, so this is the proposals that we, that, that, that we support that from the, um, from the, um, uh, advisory Commission aggregating class one and class two cops and condos and small rentals because they're currently taxed at uh, relatively similar rates, although there are on, on average, although there are wide disparities um, uh, within this uh, within these classes and the fractional assessment and then uh, you know and then tax at uh, you know one tax rate based on the sales base value, um, which uh, you know all of the properties are going to be assessed uh, uniformly at, uh, and this will remove. Uh, the disparities that we're seeing now uh, for these properties um, over time. Next. Um, of course, there is a, there is a um, uh, need to avoid large changes and to protect homeowners uh, with the uh, targeted tax reliefs that are highlighted in the, in the report from the Advisory Commission, the homestead exemption that uh, uh, targets uh, incomes up to half a million dollars and uh, for only for primary um, residents, uh, so shift some of the burden to non-primary residents uh, of the city and circuit breakers for lower, for lower income so that your taxes does not go above a certain percentage of your income. Um, you know, as part of any transition uh, mechanism, there should be a, a, a reset on sale, meaning that properties transition into the new system um, as they are transacted. Um, uh, th there is additionally in the report a consideration about doing on top of the sales, uh, on top of the reset on sale, there is a consideration about doing the transition within five years, regardless of whether you transact your property. That is something that certainly needs to be looked at. Um, that there are, there are um, you know, options to, to transition just with reset on sale. 
um, and there are options to protect homeowners by deferring their taxation, um, uh, for instance, uh, should, there be, um, should there be a large increase over time. And I'll just underline this, because this is the one place we go a little further than what is in the Commission report, um, in order to address this issue of transition, um, that you could, you could do one of two different things to slightly better protect homeowners who are going to see, like myself, who are, but, uh, uh, but all then other people in our neighborhood who might be on fixed incomes. One, um, you could say, look, your rate will go up over five years, but you can defer your additional tax burden until you sell your property. So it's not that it's being reset, but it would just, you would have to pay it when your property sold, and, and a lot of folks in my neighborhood whose incomes may be stable and not going up, their property values have gone up dramatically, and so deferring that until they sell would mean the city would eventually collect it. You could apply the interest rate that the city applies to unpaid property taxes, but not as a penalty, essentially, as a way of financing the increase. Um, or you could just wait until uh, and reset properties on sale rather than over five years. That would obviously delay the benefits, and then it's harder to give relief to people who, uh, who need it and who deserve it, but you could address some of the challenges. So those are just two additional um, sort of ideas that we uh, flesh out a little here on top of what the commission did. Okay, I wanna move now to the multifamily. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because you know uh, that I uh, have viewed 421A as just a, you know, a, a boondoggle, $1.77 billion a year for scant housing that's actually affordable to uh, working class and low income New Yorkers. So I think it's a good thing that it expired in, uh, in the spring, but we do need to attend to the underlying problem. And as you can see on the next slide, um, you know, in many ways, the underlying problem is that uh, as part of our broader property tax system, if you're going to develop a new, a vacant lot, if you build it as condos, you will pay a significantly lower tax rate than if you develop it as rentals, and it functions as a significant disincentive to the development of new rental housing, making it much more difficult to do. Um, so on the next slide, um, our proposal there, and this is not in the Commission's report, is to create essentially a class of new residential properties, properties developed after the implementation date of the reform, uh, they would be taxed at 1%, essentially at the same tax rate that's being proposed for class one uh, before exemptions like the circuit breaker. And if you just do that, if you treat both forward-going condos and forward-going rentals with the same tax rate as proposed for the new homeowner class of 1%, you essentially reduce tax burden on new rental buildings by about a third, and whereas right now you've got a significant differential where condos are taxed less, new condos will be taxed less than new rentals, you bring them roughly into parity. You can't get perfect on it, but you both you know, reduce the tax burden on a new rental by about a third and make the tax burden that that building would face if it's a rental versus a condo about even, and you can see that on the next slide as well. It's a little different in uh, core markets and hotter markets like Manhattan and, and Brownstone Brooklyn versus non-core markets, but you can see here currently in core markets that rental building that's going to be paying above 2% versus the condo that was probably well, would likely be paying below 1%, half the tax rate. Afterwards, they're pretty close to even. They both hover around 1%. Um, and you also get closer in non-core markets as well for reasons Francesco can explain. You can't get to perfect parity, uh, but this proposal gets much, much closer. Um, so next slide. So the benefits of that are, this is before you get to questions of affordability. This just makes it more possible. The lower tax rate makes market rate rental housing production significantly more possible in both core and non-core markets. Uh, for all market rate housing, you would then collect some property tax income. We estimate up to $100 million per year on average uh, that wasn't being collected um, in, uh, under the 421A system. That then leaves the question, okay, so reduce rental taxation burden by about a third for new development, but what about the challenge of building affordable housing? Uh, and our proposal there is on the next slide. And what we say here is that in core markets where something like an MIH building or an 8020 is being developed, um, let's give HPD the, under, the, the power to underwrite a tax exemption for that building 
based on the actual cost, the land and labor costs, and the actual affordability being promised. This is what HBD does. They underwrite. And so rather than have an as-of-right tax break that in many cases provides more that is necessary, underwrite those MIH tax breaks. I think there were only like six of those developments under the, in the last couple of years of 421A. So we're not talking about an enormous task to do it. And then outside of the core markets and 4HPD's traditional affordable housing programs, those tax breaks come as of right. Of course, if you're building under Ella, the extremely low income, or Sarah, the senior, you get an as of right tax break. If you're doing something that's largely market-based, your, your, your tax break is underwritten by HPD to make sure we get the right amount based on the cost and the affordability, and then you can make sure that those buildings are feasible to develop and get the tax treatment that they need without providing a $1.8 billion giveaway uh, for buildings that don't need it. And those tax exemptions can also factor in uh, the prevailing wage for building service workers. And if it's a project where that's being constructed pursuant to prevailing wage or a PLA, HPD can factor that in to the underwriting. Um, and we took a little look here and show that those options make affordable housing production feasible with the reduction of 30% on the market rate units, essentially, and the additional tax break that HPD can underwrite on the affordable housing. Um, the last feature we're proposing, I think in some ways is maybe is the newest, uh, something we hadn't put out in the spring, and I think in some ways the most interesting, because one challenge we felt existed is um, one of the most uh, hardest to justify elements of 421A was the 130% AMI program, which uh, was basically a full tax break for development at 130% of AMI. In old 421A, it was rentals. In the 485W proposal the governor made, it would have switched to condos, but still at 130% of AMI, uh, which is, is basically at the income percentile uh, the upper 25 percent of New Yorkers, like it's not affordable to 75 percent of New York households, and the vast majority of households in the neighborhoods where that product was being developed, which is why there was such opposition to it. But of course, we do want affordable production in those outer borough and working class and middle income neighborhoods. So what we propose on the next slide is to use this as the place to bring back, you know, to, to have our 21st century Mitchell Lama program. Let's establish a multifamily outer borough product which gets a full tax exemption and it'll also need HPD subsidy to build new affordable multifamily cooperatives. Um, uh, sales prices from moderate income buyers in the 80 to 100% AMI band could cross subsidize opportunity for home ownership in the 50 to 80% band. Um, and you would have them be permanently affordable on a model that says, okay, if that unit was affordable to somebody at 50% when it sells today, 10 years from now, it's affordable to somebody at 50% 10 years from now. We have some modeling that shows this is still a really attractive way for working and middle class homeowners to build equity, but it keeps those units permanently affordable over time. Uh, we estimate that uh, if you put uh, a, over, say, four or five years, a billion dollars in capital subsidy on the table, um, that you could, the number is in here, create nearly 5,000 units of truly and permanently affordable home ownership through multifamily development in the outer boroughs. That's roughly comparable to the 130% AMI units that were created in from 2017 to 2020. You do need capital subsidies, but what you get is permanently affordable home ownership um, instead of something that is basically market rate. So that's the additional proposal that we make here, and we think it goes along nicely. You are both providing tax relief to existing outer borough homeowners and bringing into play um, a new affordable homeownership option for a set of New Yorkers that otherwise are simply not going to have any options to buy uh, in New York City. Uh, so that's our proposal. Thank you guys for, for having this hearing, uh, for doing it in advance of the legislative session. We just really need to make sure uh, that we don't lose the momentum here. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Um, do you think the city, I mean, what else can the city be doing knowing that holistic reform is gonna take Albany's, uh, ultimately all, you know, Albany to get done? What else should the city be doing? Or can the city be doing? Yeah. 
Well, I think what you, you know, your dialogue uh, with the finance commissioner was important, obviously one critical element. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the mayor's the chief executive of our city and having him make clear that this matters and that he wants it and that he's pushing for it, I think is probably number one. I think there is an opportunity for the governor and the mayor to partner, but certainly uh, you can imagine the mayor is making clear we broadly support this. Let's sit down and I guess one thing, um, I don't know that we have to work out all the details. I don't know that DOF and the mayor have to get every detail worked out and then go to the governor and the legislature and say this is what we want. I think this might be an opportunity to say we support this broad framework. Let's create some dialogue because the legislators in Albany who are from the city, just like all of you, share those same concerns. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some opportunity for the council to work with the legislators alongside the mayor, working with the governor. Um, and rather than have one person try to solve all these problems, create a space for dialogue to solve them together. Thank you very much. Thank this you so much. Oh, Councilmember Brew. Oh, question from Gail. <laughs> I have All a right. question. Um, in terms of the affordable housing, I know 421A well. I know how it works. I've been involved with it for about 30 years. My question is, if you're suggesting that it be replaced with one of your programs that you suggested there, would that be a, a long-term tax abatement for that kind of housing? Because 421A ends, as you know and then you're pretty screwed in terms of the residents who are there. How would it work in terms of long-term affordability? Yeah, so first what we're proposing is a, essentially a 30% reduction in the base rental housing development rate for new development that would be permanent. I mean, that would be the new, the new base tax rate. So that's a significant reduction that would not expire. That would be the base tax rate, and um, so that's number one. Um, and then for individual developments that get underwritten, generally their regulatory agreement is the same length of time as their subsidy package. And at the end of that period of time, you need some sort of, uh, of renewal. Sometimes you need to recapitalize the building because more money is needed and goes in. Um, but you know, I think our, pro our proposal is to tie the tax treatment to the affordability and so, uh, so long as at the end of that period of time you entered into a new or additional regulatory agreement, you could continue to get the tax break. So, you know, as long as you kept providing the affordability at the same cost structure, you would still have it. And then for this new Mitchell Lama model that we're proposing, that would be permanently affordable. You know, this means if, you know, you, if you're a person at 80% of AMI and you were able to buy that unit for, Two hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Maybe ten years from now, you're restricted and you can sell it for three hundred thousand. So you make some money, but it's still affordable for the next purchase. Um, and the favorable tax treatment, the tax exemption we're proposing there, like the affordability, would be permanent. Would last. Now, this Mitchell Allen program, it would. Uh, would you talk about boroughs versus Manhattan? What was that about? I no, like no, no. Idea. So fair enough. That, the proposal that we're making for this new model would be available everywhere in the city. Um, what I, it's kind of conceptually replacing is the 130% AMI program of 421A, and that was an outer borough program, but what we're proposing would be available. The only thing about Mitchell Lamas, which I know only too well when they're co-op, if that's what you're suggesting, is a co-op board had uh, oversight over when they go private. That would not be in your particular proposal because that's how it works now. Yeah, we don't propose to have a privatization option in the model that we're creating. I will say the model we're proposing has more upside for a cooperative homeowner than Mitchell Lama currently does. In Mitchell Lama, you basically get out what you put in. You don't see any appreciation. Um, the model that we're proposing, and we'll have some more details on this soon, um, allows you some appreciation. Right, no, but I'm saying the Mitchell Lamas that buy out get plenty of appreciation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Mitchell Lamas that stay in, and, and God bless them, over 90% of Mitchell Lama cooperators have opted to stay in the system, Not even though they could make money by privatizing. Okay. But when they stay in, you don't really see oh, I, growth I at all. And the model that we have on the table allows some appreciation. You don't get to go to market. Um, but you do see, so it, there's something you know, a little more in it for the cooperators than is in it for the cooperators in a Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, controller. Thank you very much. Next up, we have 
the inimitable Commissioner James Parrott. Good afternoon. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Please begin. Good afternoon, Chair Brannon, uh, members of the committee uh, and council. My name is uh, James Parrott. I'm the Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> I was honored to be a member of the Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform that deliberated for the better part of three years. We held two rounds of public hearings in each borough, in addition to several hearings where we took testimony from local and national property tax experts. We deliberated at length in two dozen or so executive sessions where we discussed detailed and thorough presentations by the expert tax policy staff from the city's finance department, the finance uh, committee staff uh, of the council and from uh, OMB. We issued a preliminary report in January of 2020. Then following a year long COVID-19 hiatus, we resumed our work in 2021 and released the final report last December. We were always mindful of the historical urgency that motivated the need for far-reaching property tax reform in the first place. As the final report's executive summary states, our general approach was to strip the system of the features that led to structural inequities, reconstruct the system to align with the core principles of fairness, simplicity, and transparency, and then provide owner relief mechanisms and protections to help ensure low and moderate income owners have affordable tax bills and that primary residents are not displaced from neighborhoods that they have called home. Our reports documented the extreme disparities in effective tax rates wherein many very high valued property, properties have far lower effective tax rates than homes and apartments of modest value. The reports also documented how these disparities played out across the five boroughs. Our recommendations first and foremost use structural reforms to equalize effective property tax rates for resident-owned non-rental properties relative to sales-based market valuations, that is to address horizontal inequities. But we also pointed out how two targeted owner relief programs, the circuit breaker and the partial homestead exemption, could be used to introduce an element of vertical equity to lessen the regressivity of property taxes relative to income. The partial homestead exemption embodies the pied de terre tax concept of higher taxes on non-resident owners. Primary resident owners can exempt a portion of the value of their home from taxation, and we suggested that exemption be limited to owners with incomes less than 500,000. By virtue of their non-resident status, pied de terre owners would not be eligible for the homestead exemption and they would generally pay much higher effective tax rates than they do now. <clears throat> the rubber meets the road in our reforms in the final section of the final report, pages 46 to 49. I urge you to review this section if you haven't already and study the before and after effective tax rates presented in tables 22 to 24. You will see there that not only do these recommendations correct for the longstanding inequities in our property tax system and deliver horizontal equity, but they also, particularly through the option for a 30% graduated marginal rate partial homestead exemption, introduce a progressive dimension to our property tax structure. You won't find anything like that in other local property tax systems around the country. <clears throat> For example, in table 22 on page 46, which shows before and after effective tax rates by sales-based market value, 
the effective tax rate for properties under $200,000 would be cut in half or more, while properties valued over $5 million will have their ETRs, effective tax rates, increased by 63 to 109 percent. After reform, ETRs rise with sales-based market value. Table 23 shows ETRs by primary resident owner income. The graduated homestead exemption would reduce ETRs by 25 to 75 percent for incomes below 75,000 and raise ETRs by 26 to 45 percent for households with incomes over a million. After reform, ETRs rise with income. Table 24 shows before and after ETRs by borough. With the graduated exemption, the median ETR for primary resident owners in Staten Island would drop the most by one third, while it would decline by 30% in the Bronx. In Queens and Manhattan, ETRs for primary resident owner parcels would decline by about 24%. Because of offsetting, change, offsetting changes depending on neighborhood, the median ETR in Brooklyn would inch up from 64 cents to 65 cents per $100 uh, dollar of uh, sales-based market value. These reforms would distribute a would redistribute approximately $1.8 billion of the property tax burden within this new owner residential class. The direction of that redistribution is generally upward. Please do not let this opportunity pass. I urge the council and the mayor to work with our representatives in Albany and the governor to achieve historic permanent property tax reform in the next legislative session. These reforms will not only correct the inequities, that have persisted for four decades, but also give New York City the first residential property tax system with a progressive component in the nation. As you know, there is a tremendous amount of cynicism regarding the longstanding failings of our property tax system. Many people have addressed that this morning. If we fail to enact reforms now, that cynicism will persist, and this body will bear some responsibility for that. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Um, do you agree with Department of Finance saying that they need to take another look now because of COVID, impacts of COVID? Um, I tend to agree with the way uh, Comptroller Lander addressed that, that we know, uh, we certainly know enough now about the inequities that we should start the process of uh, pushing for reform. And uh, there will be changes in the proposals as we go along. The very expert staff at uh, uh, the Department of Finance uh, Tax Policy Unit, I'm confident can handle the necessary analyses. What issues did you not get to address that you wish you'd been able to in the commission? Well, uh, so there were several, although I you know, certainly agree with our are keeping the focus on the need for um, uh, uh, resident owner uh, property tax reform because the disparities there are so great. We discussed uh, the need for uh, providing relief to renters given that they pay a portion of the property tax burden. Um, we ask experts from around the country how to best provide uh, relief to uh, renters from a property tax system. The consensus was that you could really only do that through uh, a personal income tax system. And yet given our uh, mandate to focus on the property tax and be, to be revenue neutral, we didn't go there. Um, the council, and the state legislature is not bound by that same restriction and should give uh, some consideration to renter's credit, number one. We also did discuss uh, uh, business uh, property tax incentives, economic development property tax incentives in this, in this uh, city. I would say, uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, there was broad consensus among the commission that there was need for uh, you know, pretty comprehensive reform, but again, we wanted to keep our focus on the residential property tax system so we didn't go there. Third, we also uh, noted, I think it was as was mentioned earlier, 
that there are many, uh, uh, that there's a lot of real estate property owned by very wealthy charitable institutions, particularly in Manhattan. Um, there are examples from other parts of the country where pilot payments are made by similar, uh, you know, large charitable institutions to help support the services that uh, those institutions uh, tremendously benefit from. Um, we did make uh, a suggestion about, uh, we, we did talk about the possibility of having a public service fee as a way to recoup uh, some um, uh, funding to cover expenses, but we didn't make a firm recommendation on that. So in, in those three areas, there's certainly more work that needs to be done. But again, in the interest of um, ensuring that uh, at a minimum we get, uh, you know, comprehensive property tax reform, I think that should be the primary focus. These other issues do need to be addressed over time. What, what do you think the next step should be here for us? Well, uh, you know, as has been suggested, uh, suggested, I, I think it would be appropriate for the council and the mayor to get together and make a proposal to Albany on this and for the council to work with the state legislative members from New York City to get their support. Hopefully the d dynamic in Albany will be such that um, the respective uh, committees in the Senate and the Assembly will defer to the interest of New York City leaders and elected officials on property tax reform and not try and move other, other agendas that they might have or, or be interested in. So I think if there is, so to speak, a united front from New York City on the primacy uh, and, and the urgency of doing this, that there's an opportunity that that would get serious attention in, uh, in Albany. In Albany, next year is not an election year, so it's a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. Gail, you have anything? I know you talked about renters as something that has great concern to me. Were there any suggestions that came up as to how to address um, that issue? Because at least in Manhattan, we're facing, as I said, post-pandemic, um, you know, people are moving around so fast. It's very, nobody can be, um, you know, sustained in their community. So were there any suggestions that came out of that or did it kind of get kicked down the road? Yeah, um, there, I mean, uh, there was discussion of, of the possibility of doing that through the personal income tax. New York State already has a very modest uh, uh, circuit breaker uh, for renters. Uh, that could be expanded given that two-thirds of city residents do rent, though it's enormously expensive to do that, even if you, you know, tightly limited the income eligibility for that. Um, you know, I'd be happy to offer a suggestion, you know, that I have on this. This is not necessarily, you know, reflective of, of discussions in the, uh, in the commission. Um, I did reference the, the operation of the, of the homestead exemption as, uh, as a, you know, it does have an element of a pied -a terre taxing concept in it, but, it, but it, not at a very progressive uh, rate. So you could, uh, you could have a steeply progressive rate for um, uh, pied-a-terre units and use the proceeds of that to fund a renter's tax credit through the personal income tax. Given the amount of revenues that it would take to really provide a meaningful uh, you know, renter's credit, you would probably have to look at other revenue sources as well. And that's where you could, you know, revisit the uh, property tax exemptions that we give for economic development. Um, it was really unfortunate to see the governor push through the Penn Station redevelopment deal premised on basically giving away part of the city's commercial property tax base to uh, commercial real estate speculation in the, in the Penn Station area. We should learn from the past and not repeat mistakes like that. So maybe we can get some revenues if we stop doing uh, deals like that. And, and, and third, you know, there's, uh, there's also a potential for some revenue 
if large, wealthy, charitable institutions uh, can start contributing something to um, the New York City services that they benefit from. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have George Sweeting from IBO. Good afternoon. I know the draw. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. you may begin. Uh, well, now, good afternoon, uh, Chair Brannon and, and uh, members of the uh, Committee on Finance. Uh, I'm George Sweeting, Acting Director of the New York City Independent Budget Office, and I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Um, the Advisory Commission uh, has produced a thoughtful set of recommendations to be considered by the lawmakers, supported by invaluable data analysis documenting some of the biggest problems with the system. Nevertheless, the charge from Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Johnson to the Commission that its recommendations be revenue neutral and its own decision to limit the scope of its work to the treatment of residential properties left other significant disparities largely unexamined. The fact that the Commission's final report also obscures some of the distributional impacts of the proposals is a further limitation. The Commission's biggest structural recommendation would consolidate several types of properties, co-ops and condos, one to three family houses, and small apartment buildings with two to 10, yen, two to ten units into a single new residential class. All properties in the class would be valued using sales, thereby ending the confusing and counterintuitive requirement that co-ops and condos be valued using imputed capitalized net income as if they were rental properties. Limits on annual assessed value growth for properties in the new class would be, would be eliminated and replaced by five-year phase-ins. These changes would eliminate two of the most glaring problems in the current system. The present treatment of co-ops and condos is confusing and opaque. It presents assessment challenges for the Department of Finance and obscures how low co-op and condo effective tax rates are, particularly when taking into account the co-op condo abatement, which the Commission recommends eliminating. Effective tax rates measure the amount of tax owed as a share of the, prop of the value of the property. Ending the limits on annual assessment growth would eliminate the primary cause of unequal ETRs among neighborhoods for one to three family properties, while still providing taxpayers with some protection from rapid appreciation. Because of the requirement that the total package be revenue neutral, these changes would create large shifts in tax burdens among taxpayers. Unfortunately, there is no presentation in the Commission's report of the numbers of winners and losers under their proposals, nor of how they are distributed by neighborhood. By reporting on the median change without additional detail on the distribution of the change, the report obscures how large the typical tax increases would be in some neighborhoods. To give some, some sense of the magnitude of the shifts involved, I have attached a map to this testimony that shows the results of a simulation that IBO did in 2018 as the Commission was getting underway. This looks at a proposal to equalize the tax burden among one to three family properties while generating the same amount of revenue. The impact of this scenario is not that different from the Commission's proposals for one to three family homes. Uh, and if you, if you look at the map, which is the last page, the, uh, the, the key takeaway here is that the areas in blue are areas, are th these are neighborhoods in the city that the um, effective tax rate is going down and that there are a, a very large percentage of properties in those neighborhoods see increases. And the, the, the more red a neighborhood is, the more number of losers there are in, the, in, uh, in that neighborhood and the dollar amounts uh, are, uh, in many cases, grow quite large. Uh, if you want to see the dollar amounts that go with these, uh, uh, these simulations, it's available on our website if you, if you click on it. According to our simulation, about 72% of such properties citywide would get a tax cut. 
while 28% would, would get an increase. Looking at particular areas, we see that virtually all homeowners in Staten Island would get a tax cut, while 98% of Park Slope home homeowners, myself included, uh, would see an increase. Because citywide, the number of winners far exceeds the number of losers, it is inevitable that the typical tax increases faced by the individual losers is much greater than the typical decreases received by winners, as long as the requirement of revenue neutrality remains. The extent of these differences means it is likely that the level of support for these changes uh, will vary by neighborhood. The Commission also proposed a homestead exemption for resident homeowners in the new residential tax class and a circuit breaker for homeowners who are still overburdened even after the other changes. The proposed homestead exemption, which would only be available for a property that is an owner's primary residence and whose income is $500,000 or less, is a common feature of property tax systems across the country, providing an incentive for home ownership while targeting homeowners who could most benefit. The circuit breaker, which would be applied directly within the property tax, would provide additional relief to taxpayers with, with property tax bills exceeding 10% of their income, provided their income is $90,000 or less. Again, similar programs are commonly used elsewhere and would help uh, some lower income homeowners continue to afford their homes. Being consistent with the, revenue, with the mandate for revenue neutrality, the Commission recommends funding the homeowner relief by raising the tax rate within the new homeowner class, although it provides neither the cost of the relief nor an estimate of how much the tax rate, how much the tax rate would have to be raised. Recognizing the magnitude of the changes proposed, the Commission recommended that the shift to a new system be phased in over five years. While reasonable, this will in some ways make the system even more confusing during the transition period. Tax bills would be based on two numbers, the pre-reform amount adjusted for the year of the transition period and the liability under the new system with final liability determined based on the lower of the two. The Commission's proposal to end fractional assessment and transition to full valuation is likely to generate additional demands on the city's assessing core and the, and the city's tax commission staff as full market value replaces assessed value as the critical metric for properties in the new residential class. The commission offered few ideas for other property types, including utilities, commercial buildings, and large rentals, those with 11 or more units. The failure to address the difference in tax burden borne by large rentals compared with properties in the new residential class is perhaps the major shortcoming in, <clears throat> in the Commission's work. The Commission's data shows that ETRs are, uh, for large rentals are nearly twice as large as those, for, as, as those on properties in the new class. Moreover, renters generally have lower incomes. Uh, the mean for renters was uh, 67,400 in 2020 versus uh, 115,000 for property owners, according to data from the, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Although tenants don't pay property tax directly, a portion of their rent is used by their landlord to pay the tax. The amount of property tax liability that the landlord can pass through to tenants depends on the state of the rental market whether the apartment is rent stabilized and other factors, making it difficult to say how much property tax the tenant pays. Nevertheless, it seems likely that the city's renters pay more of their income for property tax than those who own their home. The wealth of data collected by the Finance Department for the Commission could be used to provide light on this opaque area. How to bring relief to, rent to tenants is also a question that is mentioned but not addressed in the report. Direct tenant relief would probably require using a circuit breaker operating through the, the income tax, and as James uh, in, uh, indicated a few minutes ago, would likely be quite expensive. The city briefly had such a credit against the city personal income tax for renters and owners that was available from 2014 to 2019. For renters, the credit assumed that 15.75% of rent paid was for property tax although exactly how they got to that number, I have no idea. But, uh, uh, so again, thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer your questions. I would also say that 
uh, in the interest of time, I did not discuss uh, the proposed changes to the class share system, but the, there's some significant changes proposed there, too. Thank you. Um, do you agree with the suggestions that um, due to COVID, we need to reassess any of the, uh, the commission's suggestions, recommendations? Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be wise to, to uh, take a look at what that is. I'm not sure that it has to entail certainly, you know, a years long delay in order to do that. I think one of the issues that's going to, you know, be, you know, is a, is a long term open question for the city is what's happening in class four with, um, you know, office vacancies. If the revenue coming out of class, or if the share of market value coming out of class four goes down, and um, you know, with the way the tax burden is distributed amongst the classes, you may have to be getting more money out of the, this new residential class than you anticipated if there's less money coming from class four, um, which, you know, I think you'd, you'd certainly want to rerun their numbers and see, you know, under different scenarios what's the uh, what, what's the distributional effect of these proposed changes if you're changing the amount of revenue you need to get out of the new residential class um what would be different if um there wasn't a mandate to be revenue neutral um the extent of the shifts in burdens uh you know in, in this new residential class would be smaller um, you would have more money to, you know, to that the, the money would be could be used in order to, to reduce the, the amount, the extent of those shifts that uh, that are going on. Uh, and with the homestead exemption, the, the reform commission proposed two different versions. Mm -hmm. Is there one that you think is better than the other? Um, I, I think the argument that uh, Commissioner Niblack made in terms of um, simplicity. Uh, has you know has has some some merit. I think if you had to get into looking at people's income taxes every year or incomes as reported through the income tax system every year, um, you know you, you certainly would have some bouncing up and down. I think in terms of the the extent of the the you know what what the value of the credit would be to the um, to the individual homeowners. So I, th I think there's. I understand the motivation for the graduated uh, uh, exemption, but I think there's, e even with clearing out an awful lot of the complexity in the system, you're still gonna have a fairly complex system because you have four classes and different differences in, in um, effective tax rates. Having uh, you know, an exemption that works in a pretty straightforward way probably has some value. Do you think this is the wrong climate to be um, considering pilots from universities and hospitals? Um, I'm not sure why this particular climate would affect that argument. I mean, I think this is, this is a suggestion that's been around for, for many years in the city. IBO, in our annual um, volume on budget options, has included a number of proposals um, Around the, the pilots from these charitable organizations, particularly the hospital hospitals and uh, university housing, um, and I think you know the there are lots of examples around the country of of municipalities that are able to get their their charitable institutions to contribute. Um, that doesn't necessarily vary just because we're you know the the economy is going one way or the other way. So. I, I, I think that's that there there is, you know, there are definitely um, opportunities there for the city certainly to consider trying to get get revenue out of that uh, that sector. Gail, thank you very much as always, George. Um, my question, of course, is when I see all that red um, in Manhattan. So does that include or take into consideration those who are? Uh, I guess the homesteaders or whatever it's called, owner occupied, would it look different if you had a map with those who supposedly will get some kind of a break? I call it the Martha Stark right. break. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it would certainly look different. This is, this is if you just do the, um, if, you, if you just equalize within the one, two, and three right. family homes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Now call up Marianne Rothman. Good afternoon. <laughs> you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I certainly do. Thank you. Please begin. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Rothman. I'm the executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums. Uh, the, our organization is a membership organization providing information, education, and advocacy for housing co-ops and condos located throughout the five boroughs and beyond. More than 170,000 New York families make their homes in our member buildings, which span the full economic spectrum from very modest income-restricted housing to solid middle-class apartment complexes to upscale dwellings. In 1990, we formed the Action Committee for Reasonable Real Estate Taxes to crusade for fairness in New York City's complicated property tax system. The Action Committee advocates for a clear and simple property tax with two classes of property, one residential and one commercial. We suggest that, these, that the two classes be inextricably linked by a fixed ratio governing tax increases on them. We suggest that this ratio be one to two. CNYC and the Action Committee have participated in every examination of the city's property tax system since 1990, always seeking fair taxation for all New York City taxpayers. <clears throat> the five white pages that I that you have in your hands are my complete testimony. The green page from which I'm reading now is an attempt at cliff notes, but I will tell you in advance that if I read all of it, it comes to much more than three minutes. Um, we've all been here a very long time. I would love to proceed, but I would understand if you prefer that I not. Yeah, and I, I'd like to just ask you, I mean, what do you, um what do you make of the Property Tax Reform Commission's recommendations? Uh, that's exactly what's in my five pages. We go point by point. Some of them we agree with wholeheartedly. We don't think the homestead exemption is uh, as complete as it should be. We think every New Yorker who opts to make their home here, who pays taxes here, who's committed to the city, deserves a homestead exemption at some level. We think that the, the system of circuit breakers needs to be much, much more detailed, um, perhaps with social justice components, with consideration for, for uh, low-income families with, with children, et cetera. Um, we um, would suggest a 10-year phase in rather than a five-year phase in, though I've heard some very interesting comments, uh, I mean, that because we worried about the um, buildings for uh, the owners for whom the, 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 there would be a tremendous increase. Um, but I like Brad, I very much like Brad Lander's suggestion about deferral of all or part of the increase until the owner sells the, the, the unit. Um, and or the uh, various comments that consider um, uh, not um, imposing revenue neutrality just on what has been uh, class one and a piece of class two. Uh, we see no reason for separating the various forms of um, commercial ownership, the multifamily buildings, the utility products, and uh, the other commercial space. They could, should be in one commercial class. Do you think the city should move forward with these suggestions as is and uh, instead of letting perfect be the enemy of the good? Um, it's been my experience in an awful lot of years of fighting for reform and um, you know what we have had in the way of temporary solution was 
<clears throat> is the co-op condo abatement, which has always incrementally had to have been extended. Um, it's been my experience that when mayor and city council go together to Albany, Albany has a whole category of legislation that it calls um, municipalities of less uh, of more than a million, and so that if the city presents a united front on this is what we want for our property taxes, um, I think that that will be granted. I, I, I think it was very wise of you to invite the governor to attend this hearing. I'm sorry that no representative of the governor is here listening because it's been interesting. As far as speed, I, I, I think the commissioner eventually promised that within three or four months he will have a better idea of what things are different um, since COVID. Uh, so I would certainly suggest waiting till then, particularly since Albany concentrates on the budget until it, that's passed in April. So we wouldn't lose time that way. It would be my hope that you would consider our very strong rec recommendation of two classes of property inextricably linked by a ratio on how their, their taxes would increase. And I think that that would, you know, opening up the door to looking at the, uh, the classes that were not touched upon um, by the um, advisory commission would give us a stronger, more permanent, more viable program. So um, I'd love to see this move fast. I was there. Um, in, in the 1990s um, when we thought we were going to have property tax reform with um, uh, Mayor Dinkins' first commission. Uh, but I think um, we want to put forth something that's extremely well thought out in every detail and that does its darndest to treat all New York taxpayers fairly. Gail, do you have anything? I go with Mary Ann Rothman, thank you. She's my council member. <laughs> Marian, thank you. We will look over all, all, all your testimony. We really appreciate this and all your hard work over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have testimony on Zoom from Moses Gates. Uh, hello. Hello. Is there, am I, is uh, everybody hearing me over there? Yes, we hear you. Uh, All right. Thanks very much. I, um, I thank you for to, inviting sorry. me to testify here on to the uh, committee on finance on property tax sorry, reform. Hang up, Moses. We just have to swear you in. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, my name is Moses Gates. I'm vice president of Housing and Neighborhood Planning at Regional Plan Association, a nonprofit civic organization in the tri-state area. We have issued so far three reports on property tax reform um, before the uh, before the council before the uh, commission on property tax reform had issued its final recommendation. Most of what I wanted to talk about has been covered by the other panelists, so I will try to be brief and make points that have not already been made. Um, First, uh, and I should start by saying we generally support the council's recommendation, uh, and my testimony today is going to focus on uh, mostly some details that we think could be a, a bit different or some other ideas that might not have made it in there. But we do believe that the commission's report and suggestions therein move very solidly in the correct direction of property tax reform. Uh, the renter credit has been a subject of conversation a lot today. We had recommended a direct renter's credit through the income tax system, or even more directly, you could um, uh, mail back a rebate to each renter directly. Uh, that's an extremely important component of any reform, not just for class two, but also for class one. Under this reform, uh, about a quarter of class one would increase in value, but class one is not only homeowners, 42% of residents of class one property are renters. And so that increase in taxes to that 
cohort would also necessarily uh, be a burden on the renters therein. In addition, there are many renters who don't pay property taxes uh, even indirectly, people in affordable housing where the property taxes have exemptions, NYCHA residents, and these are generally the folks most in need of financial relief. And you might Time argue that- Time has expired. Oh, um, and so we uh, greatly uh, advocate that we also extend the renter's credit universally, even to those folks who don't pay indirect property taxes. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for your testimony, Moses. Thanks. Next, we have Anna Champany. Hi, how are you? How are you? Hello. Let me just swear yeah, you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, so I have submitted longer testimony through the portal, but I want to highlight some of the key points, many of which I think uh, those who testified before me have already uh, raised. Um, so, but thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Anna Champany, Vice President for Research at the uh, Citizens Budget Commission. Uh, we have long advocated for comprehensive reform to the property tax system to increase transparency, equity, simplicity, and fairness, as well as to help boost housing production. The Advisory Commission's reports and recommendations are a valuable contribution, and I want to thank them for their considerable efforts. Uh, the new residential class that they uh, recommend is largely in alignment with CBC recommendations and based on sound tax policy. It would improve the current system in three ways. While values would better reflect the market for co-ops and condos, values of one to three family homes, co-ops and condos would be more comparable to each other and tax burdens would be more equitably distributed. Um, eliminating a couple other points I do want to make is eliminating fractional assessment will likely increase the number of owners in this class that appeal their assessments, as well as the fact that shifting to sale, sales based values for co ops and condos would increase market value estimates in the city, thereby increasing the city's constitutional tax tax limit and its constitutional debt limit. Um, so while not directly related to property taxation, these are uh, related to how we value property in the city. Um, in line with what uh, George Sweeting from the Independent Budget Office raised, some of the uh, information on how the homestead exemption and circuit breaker would redistribute uh, liabilities across properties uh, within the new residential class uh, is lacking in the report. Uh, while they do show the effective tax rates uh, by market value income and borough, uh, there isn't a table that quantifies how many uh, owners in each band would qualify and what the aggregate shift in tax liability would be. Time um, has expired. And I sort of the, the last two points I do want to make that have been uh, made is that they really do not address uh, the higher tax burdens for large rental and commercial property, both of which we think uh, need a closer look to ensure that uh, the city remains competitive for uh, competitive and that rental housing uh, production is supported through the property tax system. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Ali Hazak, or Ali Hazra, sorry. Ali Hazra. Okay, yes. Good evening, everyone. Just a moment. Do I need to be sworn in? Yes. yes. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Yes, I'm Hazra Ali, and I'm a member of CB2 um, Land Use um, and Historic Preservation Committee. I did prepare a document, but since a lot of it has been covered by um, previous speakers, I'll just go into areas where I feel that some correction could be made to what some of the, either the commissioner or um, the controller has made. Um, I own a condo and my taxes started at $90 a quarter. And, and right now it's up to $2,800 a quarter which is, I'm not alone in that regard. Everybody in my building is experiencing this um, increase. And I see from all the presentation, 
the you all are very much aware of these problems. Two things I would like to recommend though is that one of the suggestions for the for the um the 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 um what what was the the one family and the condos is that they started it with the income of ninety thousand dollars. And I think while that sounds like a good income to start giving a reduction, um, ninety thousand for a family of two is different from a ninety thousand for a family of of one or a family with two kids. So I think they should kind of create some kind of tier system in that area where they're looking at the homestead reduction. Also, I didn't hear anybody mention that there was a little industry that developed over the years where attorneys could now go and apply to Department of Finance to, uh, to contest the property value. So it means they were just pulling these property value out of the sky. And you have a number of law firms that are now creating biz a little business of charging company, charging condos a fee, 15% of the amount of money reduced um, by Department of Finance. Now, this is a very cumbersome and complicated system that a homeowner cannot do on their own. And you have to do it for the whole building. So, I mean, if if a, a lawyer could go in and uh, apply to to Department of Finance and Time reduce has a building value, it's it's really not fair how they they coming up with the assessed value. Um, yeah, I, since it's a time constraint, I will leave it there because I realize the 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 issue of taxation is very much in front of a lot of people's mind. Thank you very much for the work you're doing. Thank you so much for your testimony. Now we have Elise Golden. Yes, hello. Hello. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. Please proceed. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elise Golden. I'm the Community Land Trust Campaign Organizer at the New Economy Project an economic justice organization working with community groups to build an economy that works for all. New Economy Project has worked for more than 25 years to combat inequity in our financial justice, in our financial system and economy to promote cooperative community-led development. Uh, we co-convene the New York City Community Land Initiative, which is a network of community land trusts across New York City. And both New Economy Project and the Nicely Coalition are members of the Abolish the NYC, uh, Abolish the New York City Tax Lien Sale Coalition. So as we all know that our property tax system is very inequitable and in need of reform and that most of that reform can be only accomplished on the state level, um, but our tax enforcement system is handled at the city level and we need the city council to replace the recently expired system that uses the illogical and unfair tax lien sale, um, selling tax liens to a third party private uh, investor backed trust at a discount. Um, and instead we wanna create an equitable new enforcement system that remunicipalizes public debt collection, prevents the displacement of homeowners and tenants, promotes long-term affordability through community land trusts and partnerships with trusted nonprofit developers and creating a pathway for productive use for vacant lots and unoccupied buildings. And our coalition, the Abolish the NYC Tax Lien Sale Coalition is coming out very shortly with a proposal that we're gonna be sharing, um, which uses community land trusts um, and other uh, entities as a way for homeowners and property owners who Time don't want to. Time has expired. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elise. We look forward to seeing the proposal. Now we have Donna Simbo. Hi, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes, let us just swear you in. We can hear you. Can you turn your camera on, please? Um, I prefer not to, okay. if oh. that's okay. All right. 
Um, uh, just a moment. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. Please proceed. Hi. My name is Donna Simbu, a homeowner in Far Rockaway and a member of NYC Community for Change and part of the Tax Lean Coalition. Property taxes have skyrocketed for homeowners, especially in Queens, in the neighborhood I own property. My property tax uh, taxes on both my homeowner's insurance and flood insurance are built into my mortgage, which affect my cost of living every time the bank calls to inform me my escrow account is short due to the rise of property taxes. I'm afraid that the higher property taxes goes, it will eventually affect me of owning my home. Young people in my neighborhood, including my kids, are afraid to invest in homes because of high taxes and homeowner insurance premiums. I'm a mom of three grown kids, my oldest 38, a postal worker with two boys. I'm fearful of this Thanksgiving dinner conversation, worried my daughter may uproot her family, taking my grandson to another state due to the high property taxes, which trickle down to renters. Also known as, I also know some elderly who are fearful of you losing their homes due to high property taxes. Some of these homes for the elderly is in reverse mortgage and they have to continue and maintain insurance on their home and pay the taxes. The property tax system is very inequitable and in need of major reform. We ask that this committee work with us to institute a new system of enforcement for the following goals. re manipulating the public debt collection, prevent displacement of homeowners and tenants, promoting time has expired. affordability. Donna, I'll give you one more minute. You can finish up. Okay. We ask that this committee ensure that the tax lien stays dead and urge you not to support any legislation that involves selling property tax debt to an unaccountable third party entity, making sure, making sure the legislation does everything in its power to protect homeowners from higher property taxes. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hmm. Now we have Jean Sassine. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry. Oh. Caught me as a true homeowner in Queens working. Uh, um, uh, uh, let us I'm just, a, Jean, let us just swear you in, okay? Oh, copy. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Please proceed. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gene Sassine, and I'm, a, I'm with New York Communities for Change, a member of the Abolish the Tax Lien Sale Coalition. Uh, I'm glad that the chair earlier acknowledged the uh, inequality of our tax, uh, our tax uh, system, and our taxes aren't levied equally. Uh, how we change enforcement can be a big part of changing that. And one thing is uh, the tax lien sales was just another name for a uh, land grab. We are begging the council not to uh, privatize homeowner debt any longer. Make sure the, the tax lien sales uh, uh, system stays abolished, stays dead. And with enforcement being worked on, uh, with our coalition plan, we could then talk about tax equity. Our coalition has a proposal for a program that we'll be ready to share shortly. The program prioritizes robust outreach, counseling, and relief. It would also offer homeowners who do not want to sell their homes the opportunity to remain in place in exchange for putting their land in a community land trust in exchange for forgiveness of debt to the city equal to a comparable amount rather than losing most or all of the equity to foreclosure. Southeast Queens was just ranked in the recent Shark Report for having two zip codes out of the top five in New York City 
for foreclosure. We are still recovering from Sandy, are still recovering from the bubble real estate crash of 2008. Homeowners need protection. Uh, one closing thought I would have is that I hope that those circuit breakers uh, that everyone keeps mentioning are in place uh, because rate uh, times value of the home sounds equitable, but communities of color are traditionally house rich. Time has and expired. Income poor, and income poor. Uh, property bought in the 70s, like my mother's home, uh, for tens of thousands by sacrifice and hard work, uh, but not worth hundreds of thousands, but owned by people on fixed incomes. Uh, especially some of our seniors who are paying their regular bills with the just mentioned reverse mortgages and other means that are slowly draining the wealth from what they sought to build. Please protect our homeowners and our communities, City Council. Thank you. Gene, thank you, Gene. Next, we have Joan Erskine. Hi. You see me? We do. Uh, just swear you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Hi, I'm Joan Erskine. I am a member of Brooklyn Level Up and represent Brooklyn, which is a community support organization in East Flatbush and um, Flatlands. Uh, we are on the Abolish the Tax Lien Sale Coalition. You're hearing from all of us today. But I'd like to hi highlight a few things that um, perhaps for less. First of all, thanks for taking on tax, tax, property tax reform. I can't think of a thornier issue. Um, but as you pointed out, it's been pointed out, the actual reform of the tax policy has to go to the state. But the enforcement is within the city council preview, purview. And that's what we want to speak to you about. Hence the name, abolish the tax lien sale. Now, the tax lien sale is debt. We'd like to keep it that way. And to do so, the Abolish the Tax and Sale Coalition has uh, devised a proposal of an enforcement mechanism that takes not just the finance of your committee into account, but the fact that you, and you've mentioned this, and I appreciate it, that you're representing New York City. And New York City is a home, and it's a home to a lot of different people, and that is what it is first and foremost. Uh, when people say they come from New York City, they mean they live here. We live here, and we need you to help protect our homes. And the uh, enforcement mechanism of our property taxes is a key way to do that. Now, um, the as I said, the abolish tax lien sale has developed a framework that we will be will be making public very shortly. The first thing it does is it takes tax collection back into the city and not does not farm it out to profit-seeking organizations. The second thing it does is it prevents the displacement of homeowners and tenants because it gets the resources and the knowledge of what their resources are out to them at a much earlier date. They need to be, as soon as, as, soon as they start getting behind, that's when help needs to be proffered. Time has expired. So that, all right, I'll just finish up with, um, we'll get this to all of you, our proposal. We've put a lot of work into it, into thinking how we can transform the tax lien sale enforcement into something that actually preserves communities and does not leave it leave them at the mercy of a privatized um, industry. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Now we have Laura Wolf Powers. Sorry, just a moment. I'm just getting my camera plugged in. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Laura Wolf Powers. I'm an associate professor in the Urban Policy and Planning Department at Hunter College at the City University of New York. And today I'm here representing myself 
and the Western Queens Community Land Trust, where I'm a steering community member. Um, I, uh, I thank the commission for their report. I actually uh, assigned it to my students this semester. Um, it's, it's a good read. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm actually also here, like many of the people who, who just testified to talk about not, um, not the property tax reform itself, but about the city's role in enforcing delinquent tax debt. Um, as I know, property tax reform is going to be difficult, and I strongly believe that um, a program like 485W is just going to be another Band-Aid on a very sick patient, um, and I think it's much smarter in the long run to tackle uh, comprehensive tax reform. But as everyone has noted, that's a state responsibility, and I want to talk about uh, something that can be done at the city level. The city recently established a racial justice commission and put several important questions on the November 8th ballot. Uh, a couple of the council people alluded to this and um, voters resoundingly voted to add language committing the city to strive to remedy past and continuing harms done to people of color and others who have been affected by unjust structures and institutions. The committee has the opportunity to enact that commitment by changing the way it handles tax enforcement and by remunicipal remunicipalizing the collection of delinquent tax debt. Uh, every year, the tax lien sale disproportionately has harmed homeowners of color whose ability to accumulate intergenerational wealth has been profoundly affected by mortgage market discrimination, redlining, blockbusting, and more recently, predatory lending and predatory investing. By working with members of the Abolish the Tax Lien Sale Coalition to replace the tax lien sale with changes in the administrative code, the council can take an important step that redresses historical harms and creates new opportunities for wealth building in New York City neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.